are here in New York a couple of times, oh, right? How are. many of you have been here for the first time? How many first time? Wow! Yes, wow. welcome. Well, Dana, Danielle and I have been doing this for approximately 87 years. <laughs> Feels like it. And it's so good to be back in our hometown. In our hometown. Andrea. Yes. Is a, she looks different this time. This time last year she was with said child. How <laughs> is new mom lesbian life? Well, girl. <laughs> <laughs> I know we only have a couple minutes, but if anyone wants me to sit down and talk about that. I think it's summed up in that maybe the last year and the other 600 years we've done this, I've worn heels. Ah, I now wear sparkly shit. So Woo! That is how motherhood is, people. It requires combat boots. Yes. With sparkles. Tough mom. Uh, hell yeah. And while I've been home momming, every time I open my phone, turn on the TV, look at the computer, you are out there fighting the good fight. Girl. Telling us all about Trumpocalypse. How's that? Um, how is it going? How's it going? <laughs> you watch the news, right? Do you I'm have you. an extra pair of glittery shit kickers? <laughs> yes, I have brought them yes. in the back. Because I've been kicking ass all up and down. And look under your chairs. Everyone has them. <laughs> no, I'm just, just kidding. We're just not. kidding. We're not Oprah. This you don't have that conference. You, you know what you have book. under your chairs? This. Yes. Does everybody have a booklet? Yes? This is going to be your guide. We're going to tell you more about this later. But let's get started. We're, we have our first fireside chat is coming to the stage. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Give them the and warmest. Baby. Lesbians who tech, welcome. Let's go. Let's go. Hello, Deborah. <laughs> oh, you can call. You can only call her Debbie. Okay, so this is the thing. Roxanne calls me Deborah whenever we go out, and I in, and she introduces me to people that I haven't met that she knows. This is what she does. Hi. Oh, this is Deborah. I mean Debbie. I'm like Roxanne. It makes me sound like I'm a booty call, and you're just remembering my name at the last <laughs> minute. And that would never cross my mind, but <laughs> she's the best booty call I've ever had. <laughs> 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 So, so a couple of things before we get started. Um, this is my fourth Lesbians Who Tech Conference Summit. Yeah. Um, how many people were here last year? Okay, so you might 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 remember what what I said because I got on stage and when I introduced myself, I said that three years ago and now it's four years ago, I had been dumped 
and in September, so it was really raw. And I had come out much later in life, and this was my first sort of relationship that was um, public and not just sneaking in and out of Henrietta's. Um, <laughs> And, and so I Googled in September of 2015 how to make friends with lesbians. <laughs> and, and this conference showed up, the summit sh showed, up, showed up. It was like the number one thing. And so I bought tickets and I went by myself and it was terrifying absolutely terrifying to do something like that completely alone. And I did it and I made some friends. And then the next year, another friend that I had already made was also here. So year two, I had my friend Janine Toro and we did the whole thing together. And then last year I came and I spoke on this stage, which was completely surreal. And now four years later, after being dumped, finding lesbians who tech, Speaking on the stage, I'm now sitting here with the love of my life, Roxanne Gay. <laughs> oh my God! Right? Things can get better. It does get better. Full circle. Yeah. Full circle. What a journey. <laughs> like, wow. I didn't know where that story was going. I know. I told Roxanne <laughs> I was gonna. I told her I was gonna do a little preamble. Um, but I, I've interviewed Roxanne several times. As a professional interviewer, I've gotten to interview Roxanne a few times. And so rather than sort of ask the same questions that one would do in a sort of typical interview, the third time I interviewed Roxanne, I asked the coordinators of the conference if they could ask the audience what they'd like to hear us talk about, which made it much more inclusive and a little bit more improvisational. And it worked out really, really well. So when Leanne asked if we would do this, I said, can we use the same format where we get questions from the organizers and the audience about what they want to hear. So we have eight questions that we were given in advance. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to do it that way, right? Yes, we are. OK. <laughs> I'm only slightly OCD. <laughs> she printed these out, <laughs> and when we were in the car on the way over here, she was like, now we're going to talk about what we're going to do. And I was like, I do this for a living. <laughs> I'm fine. And she had made little folders for us to put our questions in. <laughs> she didn't want the folder. And as you can see, <laughs> I'm such an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just bringing the paper. <laughs> but it's a really cute much little more folder. more elegant, doesn't it? And it matches her dress. <laughs> okay, so this, the first question is um, one for Roxanne. Roxanne, you're very public on social, on Twitter, and in your writing. What is it like to have such a public, vulnerable online? It's a never-ending nightmare. That was entirely self-induced. <laughs> I don't recommend it. No. For the most part, it's fine because people think I'm very public, but I actually have very firm boundaries. So if I put something into the world, whether it's through my writing or on social media, I know what I'm doing and I know what I'm not telling you. And that makes it a lot easier to be vulnerable because I'm only vulnerable in ways I can handle. And I'm only vulnerable in ways that I'm willing to subject to the public, which can be quite brutal. But even with those boundaries, it can be really challenging because when you are a black person, when you are a woman, when you are queer, um, and when you are fat, people have all kinds of opinions about any or all aspects of who you are, and they feel very comfortable telling you those opinions all day and all night. And so you have to develop a thick skin, and I have not, uh, and that's the hard part. But for the most part, it's cool. I'm into but it, it. but it does it does seem like you have a thick skin, or at least it did before I got to know you personally. <laughs> yeah, um, now I just take it all to you. <laughs> Guess what Peter one two five said? <laughs> <laughs> and he's really important. And she's always like, "Turn off your phone." <laughs> well, so it's interesting because question number eight it is is a question for. <laughs> yeah, she did number. She numbered them. I didn't number them. Leanne did. <laughs> It says, is Roxanne on Twitter the same Roxanne at home? And is she? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. Oh, good. Um, 
it's it's an interesting it's an interesting um, spectrum because yes, obviously Roxanne is the same person, but you're so sensitive and kind and generous and sweet. Don't tell them. <laughs> And online, you're like this fucking intimidating badass who's terrifying. I'm afraid to tweet at you. <laughs> then my work here is done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of people mistake my Twitter persona, which is absolutely a part of me, as how I move through the world all day, every day. And when they meet me, they're like, oh, you're so nice. Yes, of course I am. It's Twitter. Like, Everyone's horrible. I'm not trying to be horrible, but when people are horrible, I reflect what they are. And that's on them. But, but, I, but what I think is... <laughs> what I think is interesting is the permission you've given yourself, whether mm -hmm. consciously or not, to really show that, mm -hmm. who people are when they do that, yes. in a way that it's much harder for you to do in person. Absolutely. And, and on Twitter, you can. You just yes. let loose. It was definitely conscious, because growing up, I was really shy. I still am, actually. And I was very quiet, and I was picked on a lot. And on Twitter, I finally have the ability to push back in meaningful ways. And I also have the following supported. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, and it's incredibly petty to admit that, but you know what? It's called reparations, and I'll take it in whichever form it comes. Debbie, let me ask you a question. Please well, do. I'm going to skip question number two, because it was about design trends, and she said she's not a futurist, she's an analyst. And she said it, like, in the car, and just, it was really sexy, because I was like, <laughs> damn. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, Deborah, congratulations on coming out oh, of... Oh, she's the only one allowed to call me that, yeah. by the way. <laughs> she will cut you. <laughs> congratulations on coming out at 50. What was that identity process like for you coming out later in life? And did it affect your work or how you looked or interacted with your work and your leadership? And would love to hear Roxanne's thoughts about this as well. <laughs> About my coming out or about I think you? so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came out at 50, but I think that given that my first kiss was to Patty Goldrich in third grade, I was born that way. Um, Patty Goldrich? Patty Goldrich. What's Patty doing now? <laughs> <laughs> She's somewhere in the Midwest. Oh, good. Married to a there. man. <laughs> And I remember we were taking turns playing who is the man and who is the woman. And I really liked being the man. <laughs> Despite the high femme appearance, it really was fun. In any case, um, I grew up, so I'm 58. So it's not like I came out yesterday. I've been out for, for eight years. And um, growing up in the 60s and 70s, it was something that was um, much more challenging than it is now. And as someone who was also severely abused, being that much of an other and having to feel like I could fit in and not be crucified for any more of what I already was self-loathing was just too much to bear for me. And so I did my utmost to try to fit into what was expected of me by my parents. Um, and then finally, finally had the courage to, to be who I am, and I never looked back. However, I often say that decisions are only hard when you're in the process of making them, or when you're thinking about trying to make them. Looking back on it now, I think, what was I so afraid of? I mean, I was afraid of my own inner homophobia. I was also afraid of judgment. I was afraid of how my um, colleagues and clients might perceive me, all of which was ridiculous. I remember telling one of my business partners when I, I, I sat him down, I'm like, okay, Austin, I need to tell you something. He looked at me, he's like, okay. And I'm like, I've fallen in love with a woman. I'm, I'm gay. And he's like, oh, I need to tell you something too. I've fallen in love with one of our employees. <laughs> I'm like, 
<laughs> really? I don't even get that. Um, wow, tale as old as time. <laughs> <laughs> But so it was all of my, but I do think that um, I, it was self-torture. I mean, I, I think it would have been harder for me in the 70s and 80s, without a doubt. In some, in some ways, I feel very guilty that I waited so long because it is so much easier now. And I didn't experience that public judgment that so many people did and the discrimination. Um, because now I'm, I get none. And especially now being in, in a relationship with a black queer woman I, a woman, I see how much discrimination you get, and it's mind-blowing. Mind yeah, that was interesting, seeing you recognize like how fucked up the world is, because you already have a clear sense in many ways of how horrible the world can be, and so now you have this amplified sense, which I think is really interesting. And it's interesting because I came out when I was 19 years old, and it, yeah, yeah, I was, um, I don't know, I never ever had an ounce of self-loathing about being queer. And I don't know why, because I grew up in a strict Haitian Catholic home in Omaha, Nebraska. So the recipe was right, the recipe was there. But I was just like, women are great, whatever. Uh, and I told my parents and I was like, I'm gay. And at the time, I thought I was gay. And I also just didn't want to deal with men, because men. And <laughs> my parents were not happy. But they came around eventually. And now they're great. They even hang out with us. And they love Debbie. My mom sends her shit. It's really, really, we're going on vacation with them. We're taking them to Egypt. Um, and so it's interesting to see how it's gotten so much easier to come out, but in many ways it's gotten so much more difficult to be black and to be black and queer because partly the Trump effect, I think that he has enabled a lot of nonsense and made people feel like all of the bigotry that they've quietly kept to themselves, they can share with all of us. And that's uh, interesting. I didn't think that was going to happen. You keep think, hearing things are going to get better, things are going to get better, and then they do get better, but only for some of them. Uh, and that's interesting to grapple with, especially when you are in a relationship with someone who holds quite a lot of privilege and then starts to recognize, as do I, and then starts to recognize that even within queer communities, not all things are created equal. So it's all been quite interesting. Back to our little questionnaire. Yes, on that cheerful note. <laughs> um, Roxanne, what happened with Black Panther? What are your thoughts about it now, two years later? Um, oh, Black Panther was wonderful. It was a great experience. I, ta -Nehisi Coates emailed me one night and asked me if I would like to write for Black Panther. And I said, sure. I didn't really know what that was because I only really read Archie comics growing up. And he was Wait like, a minute, really? Yeah. I didn't know this about you. Oh, yeah. I read, oh, I read them obsessively. Oh. I used to collect them. I love Archie. Oh, Tom. no, I love Archie, too, but I didn't realize you didn't know about Black Panther. I, I sure didn't. I've just watched was like, the entire Black, Black? Marvel Comics universe, all 20 Which means movies. I have, too. Um, again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of movies. <laughs> She's obsessed with Marvel. Like, we were on vacation a few weeks ago, and she watched Endgame like four times. <laughs> the, the, the day it came out, she was like, download it, download it. We were in uh, Tuscany. Yeah. <laughs> Sitting in our room. <laughs> yes. And so I downloaded it and I used technology to make it cast on the screen. And anyway, it was exhausting. So <laughs> but I've seen a it. lot of Endgame, a lot. She's still like, how about Endgame? Ugh, fine. Back to um, Black Panther. Yes, back to Black Panther. <laughs> I agreed to do it, and when he said Marvel, I just thought it was like a small upstart. And at the time, I thought, well, that's weird that there's two companies called Marvel, and I can't believe Marvel hasn't sued the little Marvel. <laughs> and then he emailed me a few weeks later, because I kind of forgot about it, because I say yes to everything, so who knows what it's going to come down the pike. 
And he said, all right, I've talked to my editor, Will. He's totally on board. Here's his email address. And it was something like will at marvel.com. And I was like, damn, they even own the URL marvel.com? <laughs> and so I typed it into my web browser to see like what their website looked like and are they gonna make a cute comic or what? And then it went to the mothership and I was like, oh word? <laughs> oh my God. And so I was given quite a lot of leeway. I just had to maintain Marvel continuity. Um, and it was really wonderful to be able to write about blackness within the context of not ever being colonized and to write two black lesbians who fell in love and certainly had complications, but neither of them died. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and neither of them lusted after um, straight women unrequitedly. <laughs> Which, I mean, who among us? <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> um, it was fun. And then, you know, it was always meant to be a one and done. I had hoped that there would be more work from it. Um, but Marvel is still trying to figure out really how they want to work within diversity and inclusion. And they have not fully committed. They've committed in, in word and they're certainly trying a lot of different things and they're doing wonderfully, I think. But they are, I think, fostering unrealistic expectations of how these comics are going to sell because they don't do any community education. My fan base did not know where to go and get these comics. It sells better now that it's available as a trade paperback because my fans know how to find that. And so do the fans of a lot of these other contemporary writers who have entered the comic space. The comic book store is a pretty intimidating, weird space. When I got the project, I went to a bookstore in um, San Francisco and it's organized differently and it was weird and the guys didn't really seem to want to answer questions and I didn't know where to start and it's like what issue this and that like there's no like clear beginning and so you just have to like dive in and I figured it out eventually but there's a learning curve and until they are willing to educate the community about that learning curve uh, I think we're going to continue to see a lot of one and done's within the comic community, but I'm writing two new comics now and it's awesome. So I have a question for Leanne or any of the um, people that are running the stage. When we got on the stage, the timer said 20 minutes and I understood we had 30 minutes. So I just want to confirm that it's okay that I go a little bit over. So perhaps I can just get a yay or nay on that. Yay? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we're taking our full 30 minutes. Oh, <laughs> there we go. There we go. Okay, great. All um, right, let's see. Well, so I think that you, you said something, though, that I want to continue to talk about a little bit, and I think it dovetails into one of these questions mm -hmm. about power. Why do you say yes to everything? Because I can't say no. <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. I say yes to everything for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that pretty much all of the opportunities coming my way lately are awesome. And so it's like, yes, of course I want to go and do this thing in Zimbabwe or whatever. And part of it is that I think for a lot of us who are writers, it's, it's challenging to become a writer and to succeed. And so you think this is going to be the last opportunity. And so you say yes to everything just in case it's the last opportunity. And then, of course, I truly have a hard time saying no. And so um, I try to say yes to everything. And so far it's worked out, but it's also really stressful because I have way more work than I can humanly do. And I have a lot of deadlines that I miss a lot, a lot. But it's interesting as somebody that also, I mean, I'm in, clearly in a, a different stratosphere. You're, you're so, you know, you have... In any case, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, where are we going with this? Well, your opportunities are amazing, mm -hmm. but even when they're not amazing, like some of my opportunities are amazing, some aren't as amazing, but I also have the same sort of compulsion to say yes, mm -hmm. mostly because I feel like this is my last chance for Absolutely. whatever it is. This is my last chance for anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, I don't know if it's, being a woman, I don't know if it's just being insecure, but what do you think that deep-seated need to 
feel like if you don't do this, there won't be anything. Where do you think that comes from? I think it comes from historical memory and the fact that for those of us who are marginalized, we are oftentimes the first. And so we know that we have to take advantage of every opportunity so, so that we won't be the last. And there's just a lot of pressure there. And it's unrealistic and it's unfair, but I think most of us succumb to that pressure in one way or another. Which actually brings me to a question for you, and I'm genuinely curious about this answer. In thinking about power, you know, power affects all of us differently and we, we wield it differently. So how do you approach reframing power that you have from an established businesswoman perspective and as a white cisgender woman? Um. I saw that question there too. I was hoping we wouldn't get to that one. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's complicated. Um, when I was first making a career for myself in the 80s and even into the early 90s, as I was working in the branding business, there were very few women in leadership positions in branding. In fact, from the consultancy side, all of the major branding consultancies were run by women, by men, all of them. Gersman and Myers, the Schecto Group, Peterson Bly, they were all white dudes. Um, I was one of the first partners of a branding consultancy. But as I came up, whatever I didn't get, and as I was fighting to make a name for myself, I never, ever considered I'm not getting this because I'm a woman. I always thought I'm not getting this because there's something wrong with me, because I'm not good enough. And that was the narrative. Not, I never ever thought, and now I look back and I think, clearly it was because I was a woman that I didn't get it. And clearly the harassment was because I was a woman and, and this dude wanted to make a move. Um, but I always saw it as something about me not being good enough, which always propelled me to work really, really, really hard. And, and I don't think that any of my success became, came because of talent. I think it came because of a work ethic that was unwavering. Worked, I worked all the time for 25 years, nonstop. Um, but in terms of power, I didn't really consider my sort of white cisgender power as seriously as I do now being with you. I've totally radicalized her, by the way. <laughs> Totally. Sometimes we're doing something somewhere and some racist bullshit happens and she gets more heated than I do. And I'm just like, yes. Because I didn't, I, I didn't, whenever I was marginalized, I just thought it was because of me not being good enough. Mm -hmm. I'm with you and you're like, that's fucking Roxanne Gay. You don't fucking talk to her like that. <laughs> and it's, it's grotesque how mm -hmm. much discrimination you get. Mm -hmm. We were in Goyard in Italy, and Roxanne wanted to buy a really, really beautiful bag. Super duper expensive. It was way, way out of my realm of what I would ever spend on myself. And we're in the store, and I'm looking at a pair. <laughs> I'm looking at a pair of like really ratty espadrilles, you know. She's looking at this gorgeous bag. And this very posh, white Italian man is helping her. Really crusty old guy. And I'm just flittering around, looking at all the cheap stuff. I mean, not that there's anything cheap in Goyard. And Roxanne decides to buy this bag. And the dude brings me the bill. And sure I did. <laughs> sure did. It fucked me up. I was just like. And I said, I'm not buying this bag. <laughs> so that was the first thing. And then, and I was, I was livid and Roxanne is like, please don't make a scene. And it was because our first, I was tired. it, was our, I was first, it like... was our first day in Milan on our vacation. I'm like, okay, I won't make a scene. We finished up our vacation in France. We're in another really expensive hoity-toity store. She's looking at another bag. <laughs> And I'm flittering around looking at the cheap stuff. And she sits on one of the chairs that's in the store like this. And another white, crusty dude comes up to her and says, please don't sit on the chair. 
And I'm like, doesn't, they, they had really nice little signs that said, um, touch with your eyes. I thought that was cute. But it didn't say that on the chair. It said it on a lot of other things, didn't say it on the chair. So Roxanne comes up and tells me what happened and I'm like, I'm gonna do a test. <laughs> she really did this. It was so funny. I was just like, I went Damn. and I sat on the same chair. Just sat there. Took out my phone. And a woman comes up to me and she says, can I help you with anything? And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> and I'm like, why is it okay for me to sit here and it's not okay for my girlfriend to sit here? She's like, what do you mean? And then I said, get me the manager. And I went to Roxanne and I'm like, you're getting an apology. And I was holding a really nice bag that she had bought me as a present and she pulled my bag to keep me from doing it and then the bag ended up in her hands. It because did. I was like a jackrabbit. And I went and spoke to the manager and I demanded that the man apologize to her because there was no reason that I could sit there and she couldn't sit there. And this happens on a daily basis. So how is my white cisgender power changed? It's changed because I've seen the active discrimination that people of color receive every day and it's appalling and frightening and heinous and it has to change. And we, with power, we have to change it. We can't stand for it. We cannot allow it to happen. Otherwise, we're complicit. Yes. <laughs> Good answer. And also, she made them all apologize to me. And because I'm just like, whatever. I don't have time for these assholes. It's annoying. Let's just move on. It's Tuesday. And we also got beverages. They were like, would Two you beverages. like champagne? Would you like Perrier? And so we had some Perrier, and I don't even like Perrier, but <laughs> we, there we were. Yeah. And you know, it's just really interesting to, to recognize, and this is why I do the work I do, and uh, I'm just gonna mention this real quick. I'm gonna be a surrogate for the um, Elizabeth Warren campaign. <laughs> and there are a lot of really interesting and good candidates this year. Uh, but she's the candidate I, I'm most excited about and most interested in supporting and also moving further left and critiquing because she's got some ideas that she needs to work on. But, you know, I think this is why it's so important that we start to think about who we want leading us as we head forward into hopefully the next four years without the current president. Um, but I have started to recognize just how much privilege I have. And so if I'm dealing with discrimination, imagine what the more vulnerable among us are dealing with because I have money and, well, manage those expectations. I'm a writer, but I pay my bills and I can take care of my family. And uh, how do people who don't have homes deal with all of the things that we're dealing with in the world. How do people who are dealing with mental illness and with different kinds of ability, how are they negotiating a world that only cares about one type of body, which is the white, male, heterosexual, abled body? And the further you are from that, the more discrimination you face. And it just it's incumbent upon all of us, especially when we're in rooms like this, where there's a relative amount of privilege at play, to do something with it beyond just coming to these nice events with these fancy stages. It's all great, I'm excited. But like, you know, we have to be a little more radical and I tell myself that every morning, like, am I being radical enough? And more often than not, the answer is no, because I'm from Nebraska and I'm a Libra. But, <laughs> but we can certainly try. And so that's the moral to this story. Yeah. Deborah Millman, everyone. <laughs> Roxanne Gay. Thank you so much for Thank having you. us here.
do we start every Lesbians Chuck and Ollie Summit? High five. Turn to your neighbor. Give him a high five. Feel it out. You look good. You look good. All right, overachievers. You've already done three. I'm counting. I'm counting. I'm counting. So I want everyone to stand up. This is the group participant. We're already, already stretching it out. All right, so this is the part of the game where if this is your first summit ever, I want you to sit down. First summit. I know you're already out. It feels, it feels hard. There will be more sports throughout the day. There will be more competitions that are a little more fair. All right, so the people that are sitting down, look up. These are the people that have been before. They know where they're going. They've read things probably more than you have in the emails, right? Just remember their faces. It's hard. It's hard. There's a lot of emails. I, I get it. All right, so if you've been to two, if this is your second summit, sit down. This is your third summit, sit down. People are doing the math in their head right now. I can see it. How many have I been to? This is your fourth summit, sit down. All right, now these are your like squad people. Like they really know where the fuck they're going. They like really, like you should follow them probably all day. All right, if this is your fifth summit, sit down. The competition's getting fierce. All right, if this is your sixth summit, sit down. All right, let's give a round of applause to these people. These are like the OG. These are the OG. Thank you, guys. This is actually, um, you know, not to brag, but this is my 20th summit. And this is, our, this is our actual 20th summit ever. We've done 12 in the U.S. and 20 another eight around the world. Um, but more importantly, guess whose first summit it is? This guy. Number one. Actually, technically, I was a little pregnant in San Francisco, but <laughs> dates, dates are, you know, irrelevant in the lesbian IUI world, so. I'm like, the math isn't right, doctor. Like, it's just like, that's not when the IUI was. There's no way I could have been pregnant before that. They're like, that's just how it works. I'm like, mm-hmm. Anyway, so I started Lesbians U Tech um, for a couple reasons, but you know, I was really looking for my squad, my people. I was starting a tech company. I'd been in the LGBTQ world for a long time. Um, and I'd go to events and they looked a lot like this. And I was like, these are a lot of gay events, LGBTQ events, and then I'd go to tech events and they'd look like this. And so I started to wonder, <laughs> do lesbians in tech actually exist? How many of you have thought that? Come on. You thought that. You thought that, right? The truth is we do. We're 50,000 LGBTQ women, non-binary folk, trans folks all over the world. We've done events in over 40 cities. We started a, a coding scholarship named after Edie Windsor. How many of you know Edie Windsor? You know Edie? She was a software engineer at IBM, literally like was the first per person in all of New York to get a personal computer. Think about that. She was literally the first person. She won awards, it was crazy. Obviously many people know her for, um, for us having the right to marry the person we love, but she was an icon. And we've sent over 300 queer women and non-binary folks to learn how to code in her name so far. We did a road show this year. We've been a little busy. Um, we're about to do another, our third annual London Summit. How many Brits we got? Brits? Oh my God, look at you. Coming up November. We actually uh, did our first ever Lesbians Who Surf, um, which is pretty, pretty amazing. I haven't been able to surf in a minute, so I'm a little sad about that. Um, we obviously have our upcoming San Francisco uh, Summit coming up. And so I wanted to walk you through a little bit of history since we're, this is our sixth summit. You know, so five years ago, this is what it looked like. Ignore the logo, right? It's, it hurts me, it hurts you. Um, <laughs> this is us in 2015, right? We're getting a little, little bit better, a little bit better. Um, these are when our MCs came into the picture, Danielle and Andrea, 2016. We got 2017, and last year, remember that? Remember that moment? We've had a thousand speakers since we've started that. Think about the visibility, right? When I first started this, I'd ask, who's one queer woman, who's one lesbian you want to hear speak? And out of 100 people, 95 of them had not one single name. 
And these were people that were in tech, worked at major tech companies. The other five people obviously said Kara Swisher, but you know. <laughs> um, but think about the visibility that's done. And today we are the largest LGBTQ professional event in the world that's focused on women. So since it's our sixth summit, I'm going to give you six squad goals, right? So think about these. Think about what your squad goals, goals are as you're kind of going through this. Um, number one, positive persistence. It is everything. You have to keep it positive, but you have to persist. There's no way that I would have been able to create this community without this model. So probably people are like, what's the one thing that has made this possible? And it's just, you know, look, like we're the only community in the world that's 100% focused on queer women. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I'll need to drink some cocktails, not right now, but later in a couple months to go over that. Um, but no, it's, it's taken a lot of persistence and I just want you to kind of hold that like, you have to work really hard and keep going, but you gotta be nice, you know? Like our email bumps, we're like, how about now? Can you register, how about now, right? Nice, beautiful uh, gift. Two, economic power is our civic duty, right? It is our responsibility to show up. And there are two ways that you can show up in this world. It's with your time and with your money. And your money is a lot more scalable, right? There's only so much time we have. So I wanna make sure that we invest in things we care about, whether it's this person or whether it's this person, I don't care, but invest in the things that you care about. It would be great if it were a woman, I'm just you know putting my little out there. But if we don't invest, if we don't spend the money, that, money on the things we care about, we're never ever going to live in the world that we want to live in. We're never going to be able to create that. It's so important. Three, things don't just change. I know it feels like that's something, but things don't magically change. You have to create urgency. You usually have to you know, use data to track that urgency, but you have to create urgency or things don't just magically change. When I first started this, I noticed, I looked around, I said, you know, most of our speakers that applied were white women. Um, obviously, I am white, our, you know, the network of people that were going out to events. And I thought, how can we make sure that we don't just create another white, com or another gay community that is mostly white, right? How can we actually create urgency? How can we create quotas? And so we started very early in our summits um, to make sure every summit was gonna be 50% women of color, 25% uh, black and Latinx. This year, we're actually 64% women of color speakers. And um, we're at 42% speakers who are black and Latinx this year. And 10% transgender and non-binary. Um, and this wouldn't have happened had we not created this urgency, right? So remember, as you're creating your goals, even for this conference, throughout your job, where you work, you have to create urgency in everything you do. Number four, one of my favorite quotes from one of the best movies, League of Their Own, obviously. How many of you have seen League of Their Own? That's right. That's how you know you have a lesbian crowd. That is how you know you have a lesbian crowd. But it's, it's the heart that makes it great, right? If it were easy, everyone would be doing it. And where is the fun in that? That's what I keep telling my wife, at least. She's like, can we get a little easier? I was like, and we're having a girl, so, you know, that's coming too. Um, uh, number five, and this is one that's actually been uh, real personal for me. This has been um, hard in the sense, you know, I, I don't actually love a lot of things. I mean, I love coffee, I love dachshunds, I love my wife. Um, but I really actually do love to work and I love to build things. I love being an entrepreneur. And, you know, my wife said to me, she's like, you gotta, you gotta mix it up again. And so I spent the last year or so really thinking about outside of work and outside of my lovely dachshunds, um, you know, what, what do I love and how can I connect that? I don't want to just like have a passion project to have a passion project. Like I want to do the things that I love. And so that's actually how the lesbians who surf thing came back and kind of backfired on my wife because I've been surfing like four times and she definitely doesn't surf. So she's like, wow, I thought maybe it'd be a, something together, but um, <laughs> that's cool. But it's so, it's so important to have that, right? But don't put too much pressure on yourself. You don't have to like find something to just find something, you know, and it's, you know, it's okay, no judgment. We can all like different things. Um, so when it is hard and when you have to persist, it's important to have a North Star. I think it's like, what, what one thing, two things, if this happened in the world, how would I know I've actually seen some progress, right? So we're not just like continually hitting our head against the wall. Someone calling for me? Is there? It's mom. Um, so my North Star, the world I, the, you know, think about the world that you want to live in. The world that I want to live in is a world where 
women make more money than men. Right? I want to live in a world where there's a black lesbian president. I think she'd make a great candidate. I would quit lesbians who tech to go work for them. I'm just saying. But what we built today is truly special, and that is because you continue to show up, you continue to invest the time. If we can take what we feel here and what we've created here, there's a warmth, there's an energy, there's, you know, you'll see this throughout the day. But if we can take that, bottle that up for the next couple of days and take that back to our companies, to the different places we work, I think we're going to continue to get to that world that we want to live in, right? Because we know if this actually, like this is actually what tech looks like. We just have to keep, keep showing up and we have to keep staying strong. We have to keep persisting, realizing that things are hard. Um, and then when they get too hard, we can really connect to the things we love. But I want you to hold all of this because what we built here today is truly, the fact that we're the largest LGBTQ professional event in the world is, is truly, um, I never ever would have thought that would have happened, something that was focused on queer women. Um, and it's truly special. And so I just want to thank all of you for making that happen. All right, you guys ready to get started? You guys ready to get started? All right, we're going to start the day the second way we start the day. You ready for another slow clap? Ready? All right, let's stand up. Stand up. Let's do it. V6.2. Ready? podcast. I have se uh, several podcasts, one of which um, uh, we're going to do here. And I just want, I have just a little bit of a question. A lot has changed since last year. There's been uh, some updates in there's life. There's been some updates in last year. And, you know, I'm in a really new relationship and it's proceeding really fast and it's going on and I'm really excited about it. Um, We've got something to tell you. Yeah. Scott Galloway and I are probably going to do it twice a week. Um, with our Pivot podcast. Um, Not and care so sisters, I'm in a relationship right now, very intense relationship with a tall, skinny, white, straight man. And I'm kind of excited about it. Um, and it was so, kind of meant to, I mean, it was your time. It was my time. Um, in any case, we're going to tape a podcast. This is Pivot. I don't know how many of you listen to Pivot or not, but it's a pretty good. And, and we try to do the week's, the week's news and everything else. And so we're going to take on a lot of topics. We, we talked about this, a lot of tech topics. We had questions from the audience. 
Um, and just get ready for Scott. He's quite a tall drink of water, as they like to say. Um, and I warned him about how to behave a little bit, um, but I don't think that's going to work. Um, I did bring along some swag from the L Word that got sent to me, so I'm going to throw it out to the audience. Um, oh, when yeah. it, it's not great swag, I'll be honest with you. I'm a little bit, <laughs> I'm worried about the show because we're of available the swag. to help. You know. Um, in any case, without any further ado, Scott Galloway. Scott Galloway. Get out of here. So the energy is incredible, but I'll be honest, I'm really nervous. You know why I'm nervous? Why? You think I'm nervous because there's a non-zero probability that I end my career here and now this morning. Yeah. But I'm nervous because you're nervous. This is very important to you. I could sense I love your the lesbian energy. suit text, my favorite event of the year. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I've, seen, I spend... I've seen Kara go on to very big stages, and she's always like, yeah, whatever, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you, I could tell you, like, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. So I'm nervous because you're nervous. Oh, so. well, we'll be fine. I think we got a lot to talk about. We have a lot we to do. talk about. Today. So anyway, I'm going to start right now with our okay. usual thing for the podcast. We do a lot of live events. Uh, we do one yep. South by Southwest. We did one in uh, New York, which we is did. great. We're going to Toronto. Yep. Uh, we're going to San Francisco. We're going to yep. go all over the country and bring our incredible brand, our incredible, like, Regis and Kathy Lee relationship to everyone. Anyway, we are live in New York to talk at the Lesbians who in tech, no, who tech, no. We're live in New York to talk at the Lesbians in Tech and Allies Summit. Everybody say hello. <laughs> so, uh, you're, how, how do you like being, you, do you like being here? And, and we're gonna talk about all the different tech issues of the day? Yes and yes, Kara. All yes, right, okay. Yes. All right, so um, one of the things that we did talk about is how you can be a better ally. Yeah, to say the, more. To say more. And so what I did is what naturally, what I think is really important for you to wear is I brought you a T-shirt um, so you can wear it. It says Lesbro. <laughs> Who wants to see a 54-year-old man change his shirt? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Scott, no one's interested in you here. Well, most places, actually. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Okay. All right, so we have a lot to talk about this week. We're going to use Pivot. You know, we use Pivot as a different platform, but it's really important that we use it to talk about the issues in tech that affect... Um, affect all, all communities and try to push for more diversity. So we're very excited to be here. So one, speaking of sort of interesting things, I interviewed Marianne Williamson this week, and tomorrow I'm going to interview Bill de Blasio. So I'm going on the people who didn't get into the debate tour, uh, essentially. So it was a really interesting interview with Marianne Williamson. Yeah, and I'm actually hosting um, Michael Bennett, another guy who didn't make. Right. And it's, it's interesting to think about kind of unexpected consequences and the so the Democratic National Committee wanted to ensure that it was more inclusive. They were accused of basically railroading uh, Hillary through, so they tried to be more inclusive, and they came up with all these rules. And, you know, they're sort of damned if they do, damned if they don't, but the notion that you have to get a certain number of donors. Right. And what's ended up happening is that uh, people are paying 70 bucks to Facebook and Google to get a $1 donation, right? Right. And it's, it's also... I mean, I feel as if we have some people on stage. The big winners through all of this are the off-card people, the Andrew Yangs, the mm -hmm. folks you're talking about who've gotten incredible awareness. And they're going to have to flip it back because you're going to literally see 100 people run for president in the next 100 cycle. 100 people, next cycle. Yeah. So what, Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Yes. I, I think <laughs> your, your point is that it shouldn't just be people who've been politicians their yeah. whole life. But I think the DNC has an obligation to probably screen out earlier some people who put, shouldn't be on the stage. I think it's taken a lot of oxygen away from people who have an important but who message. who should? I mean, that was an interesting discussion I had with yeah. Marion Williamson. She feels she's more in tune with Americans than she, she was saying she's in 2019 
uh, politics, and most of the candidates are in 1985 politics, which was kind of interesting. And when actually you meet her in person, it is kind of interesting that the media sort of has to portray her. Like, it was really interesting. David Brooks wrote a column where he called her a wackadoo, which, and then agreed with everything she said, which was fascinating. And, you know, it, she, it's really interesting how she's portrayed, because she's quite, you know, there's some controversy around what she said about uh, vaccinations, which she has a, she had a relatively good explanation for, but a lot of people don't, still don't believe her. Um, she didn't say she was praying away the hurricane. She was talking about prayer in general, which I think a man would be allowed to do very easily. So it was a really interesting interview, and I was, I was surprised, you know, one of the things she said, I think you'd like her too, I think a lot of people would like her in person, she thinks that if we don't make a change that young people are going to storm the Bastille. And so she, that was the most interesting thing she was talking about. And she was talking about how, you know, the, the populism in this country and, the, and the, uh, the hate that's growing is problematic for politics. I think it's, well, one, there's a huge divisiveness, but typically throughout history when we get to this level of income inequality, Yeah. Uh, there's, it self-corrects, and it self-corrects in war, famine, and revolution. And I think we're going through a soft revolution where so people have just had it. Just had it with wealthy people, most of whom are tech people. Well, that, that you know, the top 1% have doubled their income, while the income of the bottom 50% have been half. 13 people are worth the same wealth as the Southern Hemisphere plus India. And it's pretty basic logic. At some point, when half, when three and a half billion people go, the easiest way to double our wealth is to take away the wealth of these 13 people. They figure out a way to do that. I mean, it's kind of happened over and over in Central America and different economies where if you don't have some level of empathy or redistribution and all the wealth and all the spoils and all the good stuff aggregates to fewer and fewer people, at some point everybody else says, all right, we've had it. And when you see all these very wealthy people talking about we need to, you know, we need higher taxes, it's not that they're being progressive, it's, it's self-preservation. Mm -hmm. They recognize at some point people are just gonna show up with land, you know, And yet you point out this, this week at CoCommerce that Amazon, yeah. you were specifically talking about Amazon, didn't pay any taxes or paid very low taxes given how much money they make. So since 2008 or approximately over the last 10 years, Walmart has paid $64 billion in corporate income tax, mm -hmm. Amazon has paid 1.4 billion. And a huge, a huge, our economy is just not used to a company being this successful and never paying taxes because it's not profitable. Typically, the markets demand a company becomes profitable at some point, and our taxation system is based off of profits. In addition, you have this genius, and Bezos is a genius who's figured out a way to perfectly game the system where he never pays taxes. So remember, and we talked about this uh, at Code, in the 1980s, it was basically this racist whistle call where Reagan had this caricature of what he called a welfare queen, right? The mother of all welfare queens in our society is Jeff Bezos because he owns, he owns approximately, he owns approximately 17 or 20 percent of Amazon. Amazon extracts billions of dollars in tax subsidies, subsidies by gamifying the process to put their data center here. He makes it irresistible for a municipal official who wants to be the one to detonate a prosperity bomb in their city, not to fork over tons of benefits and tax subsidies. So say two to three billion dollars gets transferred from the city of Phoenix or Denver to Amazon to put their new data center there. That's technically a transfer from all of us who are taxpayers to Jeff Bezos of approximately a half a billion dollars. In addition, he himself never pays taxes because yeah. anyone who's worth that kind of money just borrows against his holdings at a low interest rate of 2%. But he's worth $164 billion. He's the richest man in the world. And he is a net, a net, um, debtor or taker. So the National Park Service, the Central Intelligence Agency, the Navy, and Jeff Bezos are taking money out of the Treasury, not putting it in. So hands down, mother of all welfare queens for the ages, the wealthiest man in the world. All right. you know, Alexis is a good thing. Which is why we probably lost that sponsor at Code Commerce, because he was going on about this. But that's OK. We like that. So, um, so I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to move into actual news this week, because we do news, we yep. do predictions and everything else, and we have questions from you guys. I'm going to put on AR glasses, uh, which are from uh, Focal. They're, they're at Lisa Zane's in the audience. And what's augmented right now? What's happening? There is a screen right here that I'm looking at and getting some information about you, Scott. Yeah. And it, it comes with this. Um, it's really interesting. I, I just think it was interesting because I'm kind of fascinated where um, AR is going and, yeah. and where these glasses, because as you know, Google Glass, while it was 
was not a um, was not a hit. Yeah. I think technically it was the right thing. It was the idea that we're going to have glasses on our face. I think these are pretty attractive. And what you do is you wear this no, ring. It no. kind of looks, no? No, not yet? That's, that's not a wearable. It's a prophylactic. All right, no, not quite yet. Oh, that's nice. But let me, listen to me. I like these better. I think eventually these are going to get amazing. What happens is you use this as a joystick, and I can see time like I see? I, right now. Yeah. You're going to touch my joystick? All right, okay. And so what happens? So what like happens, what? I get all kinds of information right now. I'm looking at Spotify, whether I want to turn it on and play it. I've got messages. I can see it in this little eye, eye thing here. Um, and then you, you can just, oh, it's on. I don't know if it's on. But anyway, so it goes the time, messages, all kinds of stuff that, you're, that your calendar, um, just pretty much a lot of things. And I can call an Uber on it, which is interesting, and actually send out texts. Which is in my calendar and things like that. So it's, it's coming. So eventually, this is. So eventually, this will have a lot of information on there it. There are technologies you want to overinvest in. There are technologies you want to underinvest in. This is absolutely one you want to underinvest in. I think you're wrong. I think you're utterly wrong. You know who's in this? Intel and Amazon. Well, and Mark so. Zuckerberg said it was going to unlock new worlds. No, it hasn't. It hasn't done anything. Yes, but because it's early. You're wrong. You're 100% wrong. Everyone's going to have something on their face that is going to. That's going yeah, to Ray Bans. <laughs> okay. In any case, someone's, everyone's going to have these. And as you move through, and I agree, uh, Google Glass was the first yeah. iteration of it. But yeah. eventually, this is how we're going to get our information. We're not going to be looking down at phones um, or doing, you know, and, and staring and wandering around the streets. I think you're going to have a heads-up display, and you're going to look at it. And this one is getting there. This is absolutely getting there. It's really interesting that Amazon and Intel would put this amount of money, and I think a lot of people do believe well, in it. Supposedly Apple's coming out with their own pair, right? Well, I'm sorry? Supposedly Apple's coming out with yes, their own Yes, Apple's pair. coming out right. with their own which will probably be super attractive. So eventually yeah. this will get really interesting. It'll not be as heavy on the side. But this is a quantum leap from Google Glass. Is it? Yes, 100 And what's the name of the company? This is Focal. They're from Canada, so they're very nice. Um, so I'm really, I'm really, I, you know, I don't, if they make Ray-Bans, I may wear them, which will be great. Um, but I think it's really interesting that this is, this is kind of the new stuff, kind of investments that are being made in these kind of things, um, in food and agriculture and stuff like that. But let's get to the news of the day, a big story breakdown. Um, uh, speaking of large, uh, state AGs go after Google and Facebook, 50 state AGs. Yeah. Um, so basically all of them, including D.C. and Puerto Rico, are yeah. joining an antitrust probe of Google, spearheaded by Texas state AG. California and Alabama are out. Go figure. They'll probably do it on their own. Um, last week, Letitia James um, uh, announced that she would lead a similar probe into Facebook. Antitrust probes might be the thing that brings Republicans, Democrats together in this country, yeah, which is yeah. amazing because they can't agree on lunch. Um, and it's, you know, it was sort of spearheaded by Elizabeth Warren. She was talking about it earlier. What do you think about what's happened, what, the, what has occurred here this week? So I'm really... Finally, uh, the thing is dropped or whatever. I'm thing. really hopeful, right, it, that there's finally a bipartisan issue that people... Now, they're going after tech for different reasons, the red states and the blue states, but when you get 40... I think it's, I think it's everyone but Puerto Rico and, and California. California. I think it's really exciting. And that the fact that they're coming together, um, it's well overdue. It'll take a while. But it's similar to tobacco, where they said, look, we're sick of waiting on DC. We're going to do it ourselves. Right. So it looks like the states are coming are coming for Google. And we said this but earlier. But do you think there's a something will actually happen? What, do you, yeah. what would you predict would happen, would actually occur? How long will it take, and how long can they agree to it? Uh, it'll be years, no doubt about it. But at some point, there'll be a grand bargain, either for an enormous fine or prophylactically, Google will break itself up and come to some sort of deal. So what do you think they're going to do? Break off YouTube, presumably? Well, you talked about this. You predicted this. You think it's yes. going to be a spin of YouTube. What's yeah. interesting is they're going after the ad part, the kind of the double-click part. Right. Uh, but something, the breakup has, has started. And what the markets get wrong is that the stock is going to skyrocket once people start doing that. And why is that? Well, we make the mistake of believing that antitrust is bad for companies when they get broken up, that it's some sort of punishment. And what we have to, I believe we have to do is not look at it through the rubric of they're bad, so we're doing, we're punishing them. But a natural part of our economic cycle is that when a company becomes an invasive species and kills small companies and prematurely euthanizes big companies, that it's healthy for the economy to go in and break them up. And when we broke up AT&T within 10 years, each one of those nine companies was worth more than the original company it was broken up into nine pieces. When eBay spun PayPal, PayPal's now worth five or ten times what eBay is. So you're going to see a massive unlock in shareholder value. So, so breaking, breaking up Google, pulling off YouTube or the ads off of Google, or taking yeah. Instagram off of Facebook, which it seems to be integrating even further with Facebook dating. 
which but, but are you using Facebook dating? Just curious. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. Ever? Uh, would you ever use, fa if you weren't married, would you use Facebook dating? Uh, I'd use all of them. Okay. And right. I would just be, you know, at, at, at work for some reason they call me Swipe Left. That's my nickname. <laughs> um, what? Yeah, I would use all of them. You, I, but you feel good about Facebook, but they're using Instagram as uh, the... I think Instagram's the right brand for it. I yeah. don't think Facebook is. I don't think people trust Facebook, but I think Instagram's a great brand for right. dating. I think it could be huge for them. But now it's called Instagram by Facebook. So this is, this is interesting too, right? And this is kind of signals the end of the brand era, and that is Facebook has decided to say, all right, Instagram by Facebook, or um, WhatsApp by Facebook. And right. every marketing professor in the world had a grand mal seizure when they heard this. Mm -hmm. Because, it, but what this really indicates, and I thought about it, is the end of the brand era. And that is the way we've traditionally created shareholder value is to come up with a marginal product and wrap great associations around it. An American car that's kind of a mediocre, shitty product, but make it feel tough and American and like a rock, right? And then, and then print money with your marginal product, but great associations and great margins. And I think we've officially left the brand era for the monopoly era. And what Mark Zuckerberg has decided, I mean, this is equivalent of Volkswagen go, I know, let's, let's call it Porsche by Volkswagen. Or a Boeing going, okay, the 787, let's call it the 787 Max, right. right? This just makes no sense. But what they've decided is they want to conjoin the triplets. And if they can in any way reduce the likelihood that they're broken up, which is a half a trillion dollar franchise or monopoly, that that is worth the erosion of tens of billions of brand value and brand equity. So, so they're Mark's, trying to stick together in order to avoid being broken They're up. trying to put the three together such that he can say when the DOJ or the states come in, that he can say, look, if you try and separate the babies from one another, you're going to kill the whole yeah. being. He's purposely trying to Scott, encrypt everything sounds, and conduct. That sounds sneaky on Mark Zuckerberg's part. Yeah. What do you think? I don't know. I hope it's not going to work. I, yeah. I, if I were the DOJ or the FTC, I would move in you know, right now, and I would say, look, uh, wh whatever, Stop. whatever you do right now, just be clear. If we find they have said that, Megan Delahunt we'll has said that. We'll break your ass up. Well, I mean, the, the head of the Justice Department, I trust. So, do you? So, you predict a breakup? You think that's what's going to happen eventually? I think any, a combination of antitrust and regulation. I think all of them, at some point, either themselves proactively break themselves up. So, prediction. I love predictions. By 2025, the most valuable company in the world will be AWS. Amazon Web Services. Okay. Amazon will spill into AWS, and AWS will be the most valuable company in the world. Because right now, there's no pure play way to play the cloud. Right. The cloud is the fastest, most pro growing, most profitable part of technology right now globally, the cloud. How do you invest as a retail investor, an institution, or endowment in the cloud? If you invest, you got to crawl over a search engine to get or to Google Or Microsoft cloud. or Google. you got to crawl over a software company at yeah. Microsoft, and you got to crawl over an e-commerce company and a bunch of other things, and the marvelous Mrs. Mizell, to get to the cloud of AWS. If AWS, if the fastest growing pure play company in the fastest growing sector and the most profitable sector was a stock, we'd all own it, or all of our pension funds, all of our unions. Interestingly, I've actually spoken to the CEO of AWS, and he said he's not going to go public several times. But we've had this conversation. He, no one can say, you know what, I'd like to be king, because they end up dead the next day. Right. No okay. one can say that. All right. No one can say, yeah. So, but be clear, Andy Jassy wakes up in the morning and looks in the mirror and he goes, hello, CEO, the most valuable company in the world. Right. Well, we'll see if he does that. Yeah. It seems indicationless. Interestingly, as much as they protest going public, we work. Yeah. Go yeah. on. Go on. Go on. So you have been riding the re we work yeah. S since the S1 came out, the, the most crazy S1 of all time. Um, its biggest outside investor software yeah. urged the tech company to shelve its IPO. I feel like we're responsible for that. I feel good about yeah, that. Yeah, it's definitely us. That, <laughs> that and the fact this company makes absolutely no fucking sense. Okay. So, <laughs> so but now the company is supposedly going forward with the IPO. Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, I don't think, what's going to happen then? Okay, so I don't give, think the give a quick get public. for people who don't know. We work. You've probably all been in one. How many people have been in a We Work? Lots of people, right? It's very nice. You have the you have the beer and the kombucha and the wallpaper and the slightly above IKEA tables kind of thing. Um, and they have put out an S one, and we've always felt that I've always felt they're a real estate company essentially. Yeah. And and the guy who runs it has 
very luxurious hair and is, is says yeah. a lot of things about feelings and happiness and whatever. Yeah. But he's a real estate company. Yeah. And they've been proliferating like kudzu all around yeah. the country. Um, and when this S1 came out, it was pretty shocking how much he owned a lot of the buildings in it, which is, is about a lot of self-dealing. He got a, a giant $700 million loan, essentially, or took $700 million out. Yeah. Um, he owned the brand. Um, and then the business is just terrible. It's a terrible business. So we started, yeah. especially Scott, started banging on this IPO, which was comical. Like, it was weird that they even put out this S1. Well, first off, you got to be dangerous of cults. Cults of personalities are usually terrible stocks. So uh, typically a CEO... Well, would... Apple. Hello. No, that's not true. Come on. I'm on a roll. Okay. All right. Sorry. So... On average, unicorn CEO prospectuses. Netflix. They mention the name. You know, they mention the name Dara and the Uber in the Uber S1 23 times. In uh, Lyft, it was like 18 times. The term Adam is used 169 times. In this the, is Adam the, Newman, the CEO. Adam Newman, the CEO. You have a company that is scaling its losses, so it'll be do three billion in revenues this year, and it'll lose almost that much. So if I, I take Uber, which is SoftBank, all the time because for a $15 ride you pay 10 bucks for. So it is economically irresponsible not to take Uber everywhere because it's being subsidized by SoftBank. And right now, WeWork is losing you know, almost a dollar on the dollar. So you have a company, and it has no gross margins, meaning that as it's, the company scales, it just loses more money. And the thing that's going to actually probably, is probably going to ruin the uh, WeWork IPO um, is Uber, because Uber has shown that it can't, it, you can't scale a company with negative gross margins. You just scale your losses. And they're, in, right. they're starting what I believe is an in Well, they, this week they've spiral. had a lot of, we had the Uber Eats uh, had, had, had code, and even Uber Eats looked like it wasn't making much money, and that's considered yeah. their growth engine, which was interesting. But Uber's uh, talking about, there's rumors of layoffs, there's marketing yeah. issues, there's obviously the costs coming in, and that's also a soft bank investment. A, yeah. That's how I put an enormous amount of money in at the, at the end. Um, so Uber is showing what, that you can't run these, but you can't have businesses that lose money into eternity, correct? Well, it's okay, so if you, uh, Smile Direct is going public, I think, tomorrow. Uh, I, I Invisalign, I don't know if anyone else, else here Invisalign. It's nice to be doing orthodontia at 54. Um, <laughs> But it's a great company, a great technology, and a company came in at a lower price point, about half the price point, and cut out the orthodontist and has stores and spends their money on marketing and is growing. It's going to grow to a billion dollars this year. It's growing about 150% a year. It's incredible technology, and it's got gross margins of 69%. So it's losing money, but when you're making 69 cents on every dollar of product you sell, at some point, if you get big enough, you're going to start making money. But the thing about Uber and WeWork is that for every dollar in incremental business, they lose a dollar five or a dollar fifty or two bucks. So this company shows no signs that scale or size would ever result in profitability. They would fundamentally have to change their business model. And Uber is showing that doesn't work. There's just a very basic analysis showing that the companies that have lost the most money the year before they go public are generally terrible performing stocks. And all of a sudden the market, which is prone to fits of sanity, has kind of sobered up and said, look what happened on Lyft times that by two, and that's what we're looking at with WeWork. So WeWork, by the way, great product. Actually, I actually think it's a great, uh, you know, an interesting company. It's probably worth five or seven billion dollars, but the problem is they've invested 12 to build a company worth five to 10 billion, and the market is realizing that. There's gonna be this ripple effect with SoftBank because they have raised money based on debt that was securitized by the value of their stake in WeWork, which they right. valued at 47 billion. And the markets are about to remark that debt or that collateral at a much lower price. So what, what happened, SoftBank has wandered into the handing out $200 million checks to everyone in Silicon yeah. Valley. By the way, half that money comes from the Saudis. We'll get into that yeah. in a minute. Um, thugs is what I like to call them, um, from Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah. Um, and so this money has sort of changed venture capital in Silicon Valley. This has been like a crazy time because what happens is someone does a deal that's already crazy yep. and SoftBank walks in with their giant checks and makes it 10 times crazier. Venture capitals hate, who are never really controlled in Silicon Valley at all. There's not enough rat holes to shove all the money down there. But they, they, they hate what so, uh, SoftBank has been doing to the Yeah, to SoftBank's the basically come in and blown all the traditional masters of the universe out of the water. So typically what's been happening is you're the leading something in cloud. 
and you want to raise 50 million, and you get a, a term sheet from a tier one VC in and Andreessen and Horowitz, and then SoftBank shows up and says, you are raising money at a, a valuation of 100 million, you wanted to raise 50, so we get a third of the company, tell you what, we'll raise your valuation to 200 million, we're gonna invest 100 million, and if you don't do this, we're going to the number two space and we're giving them 100 million. And they're literally blowing every other VC and every other term sheet out of the water. So they're hugely disruptive. But what it looks like now is that they've been drunk, that they've mm -hmm. been throwing too much money at too high valuations. And I think we're going to start to see an unwind. Right. And whenever you have a recession, largest post-war expansion in the history of our economy, 11 years, recessions always happen. That's the bad news. The good news is to go away. But we're due. And it always comes from an area we're not expecting. And this could be an area. When we see the information economy start to like unwind and implode, that could be it. I personally think it's going to be the deficit. We're not worried about the deficit. It's ridiculous that we've managed to have the lowest unemployment and the greatest deficit in the history of the country. That's like hard to do and we're doing it. But it could also be SoftBank could be ground zero for the recession mm -hmm. if all of a sudden all the stuff starts unwinding and all these unicorns start crashing and all these private companies can't get out. There's layoffs in the part of the economy that we thought was going to drive all the innovation. This could be SoftBank and this story could end yeah. up being much bigger than we think. Yeah, but people think well, WeWork might be the moment. So I've, we, I've gotten so many texts. It's the firewall. Yeah. Like yeah. everyone's going to go just a second, even though it's kind of a yeah. relatively silly company in comparison to a lot yeah. of them. Um, but it'll be interesting to see if they go public or not. You don't yeah. think they're going public. You I don't that. think they get out. I think the consensual hallucination between companies and the markets is ending. All right. And this company, it just, this company makes uh, absolutely no sense. The governance is terrible. Does that ruin the IPO market? All the, you know, there's a lot of people with startups here. They're trying to get funded. What would you do if you're like in this market as it starts to unwind? Is it curtains for everybody or? I hope not. I don't think so. I think there's a lot of fantastic companies out there, but companies that lose money. Here, here's what's happened, this really weird dynamic. Amazon invests so hugely invested. We've never seen a company make those sorts of investments and keep losing money. But Amazon has positive gross margins. Amazon was able to create this flywheel effect and, and spawn these amazing businesses. Mm -hmm. But everybody has adopted, not everybody, but a lot of companies have adopted this philosophy that if we just grow, regardless of the losses to fund that growth, we're going to be Amazon and we're going to be fine. Yeah, they keep calling themselves Amazon. Yeah. We're Amazon of. No, the, the, I thought the most outrageous one is they've decided, let's take the names or the words of the most profitable sectors. So the fastest growing, most profitable sector is the cloud or uh, arguably in software, SaaS. Mm -hmm. So they've decided to call themselves space as a service, SaaS. They right. use the word technology in their prospectus 123 times. There's nothing, there's no technology at WeWork. They're a real estate company. They, they have an app for meetings. They've got an app for meetings. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> they invest long. They pointed that out to me in an email. They invest <laughs> long. They do 10-year leases. They, they do 10-year leases. They have a $43 billion yeah. in long-term obligations. Very analog. $43 billion yeah. in long-term obligations. They'll do $3 billion this year in short-term leases. What could go wrong? And there are companies that build nice businesses, investing long, and then arbing out short-term rental. Hertz does that. They buy a car long-term, and they arb it out short-term to people who just want yeah. a car for a day, and they make money. That company trades at 0.2 times revenues. WeWork is claiming that it's worth 17 times revenues. Amazon is worth four times revenues. Right. IWG, its biggest competitor, or the closest analog, Regis. Remember Regis? It's just bad plants and bad coffee, but it's basically WeWork. They trade at two times revenues, right. and they're profitable. So the do, company gets out. Do you feel better out. about the scooter companies? You know my beloved scooter company. Didn't they just open? Didn't they just drop in Brooklyn? The scooter aren't there scooters in Brooklyn? Yes, now? they're coming to Brooklyn. So what's? I Bro have to be in Brooklyn now a lot, so, which is interesting. But they're bringing scooters, which will so make you I'm scooter. Very I do. I, Break down the scooter world and who wins and who loses in that. I think I think it's an interesting bit because they do like they don't have the drivers, they don't have a thing. They have if they start to figure out the execution and the usage of these things, they can do that. They can be like I don't know if they'll be worth a billions of dollars, but I think the two independent ones I think are really interesting. Lime and Bird. Um, Lime is run by a really smart guy. I just did a podcast with him, Joe Krause, and some others there. And I think it's a real it's. The way he explained it, he seemed to convince me, and maybe I'm being stupid, but uh, I really enjoy it. I use them a lot, and, and you can start to see as it, it's, it's much more sustainable than an Uber or a Lyft, I think, in terms of making money. I don't think it's worth the crazy amounts they're worth, but.
See, just as a citizen, I think they're a menace and the equivalent of littering. I hate cities with scooters. I think they're everywhere. Well, get ready, my friend. Get med Well, I, I, I don't agree. I think it's a great last mile yeah. solution. And I think you love it. I've seen you on them. It's I kind love of them. a disturbing image. You see, I'm in Austin, and I see Kerrigan rolling with her, with her Ray-Bans <laughs> on the thing. It's like like the, the weirdest, strangest invasion of an alien force in history. Like, you know here what? she comes. I look good. I look good, and I like them. And I, you wear, I carry You're my helmet around now. You should wear your helmet, by the way. Lime and, and others are trying to innovate in helmets. The, that is a big problem, is safety. Helmets. Their biggest safety. problem is safety. I think safety and figuring out the logistics of it. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, I think, their issue is, is people hurting themselves. My brother is always like, if you want to enjoy no elbows, Kara, go right ahead. He's a doctor. Um, anyway, so um, yeah. speaking of not scooters, uh, I wrote a column this week about Joey Ito of the Media Lab. Yeah. An appalling, sexist, horrible story of, and pedophiles, dirty money. Um, they, they had taken money from Jeffrey Epstein, yeah. um, quite a bit of it, and uh, the... Um, the head of it, Joey Ito, who I know very well, had to resign from the MIT Media Lab because it had turned out through a story by Ronan Farrow that he tried to cover up the, um, the, the giving of the, the money. Um, and he had, they had given a name to Jeffrey Epstein with, with, with it, within MIT Media Lab, which was Voldemort, he who must not be named, which was just, it just was one appalling detail upon the, the next for this thing. And a lot, it turned out a lot of their scientists were hanging out at Jeffrey Epstein's island. Um, he was involved in a lot of these dinners. I've been to one or two of them, not with Jeffrey Epstein, thank God. Um, but uh, he had just been, he was per pervasive within these science and tech communities. And it's gonna, there's gonna be more coming out, I think. Um, and one of the things that was interesting is that they, they, the emails that Ronan uh, uh, surfaced um, about uh, about that, and yeah. so one of the things when I, I wrote a column in the New York Times it was pretty tough. Joey, who I've known a long time, um, and I, I get that, what I wrote was not every fortune is clean. It is impossible for every donor, or investor, or advisor, or leader in tech to be perfectly pure. But if you can't manage to say a hard no to those responsible for the dismemberment of a journalist or to a predator of young girls, I am not sure what to say. So I was <laughs> trying to. It was incredible, though. I'll tell you. I got a ton of pushback from lots of people in the comments and on, uh, I did a live Twitter, and they're like, what's wrong with taking money from Jeffrey Epstein if it's for the good? And I, I was literally like, he's a pedophile and you shouldn't take his money. I feel like that should be a, the way it is. And it was really interesting that there was a big debate going on whether to take money from bad people. But what happened here at the Media Lab was they were covering it up so because they knew that taking money from someone who was a convicted sex offender was probably a PR problem. So, but so, and I'm 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 arguing here to learn, not to okay. be right. Yeah, right. But sure. Go back to when he took the money. They yeah. took the money. Yeah. He was a guy who was a sex offender. No, they took it after he was convicted. Yeah. But he quote unquote served his time. What yeah. you say? Were they were they were they cognizant of the additional crimes? Yes. Uh, no. No. They weren't cognizant. No. No. But they were cognizant of the crimes, and it was I think. You know, there had been rumors about this guy yeah. for a long time, yeah. but they were, he had been, even that sort of shitty conviction that happened that got overturned, yeah. um, that he was, you know, that's why he was brought to New York to be yeah. tried here and he killed himself. Um, rest in non-peace, Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, but um, he, uh, they were aware of the problem. Yeah. And so what was interesting to watch in the, in the emails was how much, how, what, what links this media lab, which is an important tech, yeah, a lot of big people. My ex-wife is on the um, is on the advisory. There's a, there's like a dozen, a hundred yeah. people on this advisory board. It's all luminaries and stuff. Um, she went there, um, and what was fascinating was the lengths they went to hide the money this guy was giving. Yeah, um, and I just I could, I was sort of like if I, I every day I think tech cannot get worse, and I thought this is just an astonishing display of lack of any kind of judgment, the same thing, lack of consequences, lack of ethics, lack of care about anything. And it was sort of like, I, I was like, I've had it with these people. Like, this yeah. is insane that you have to argue whether it's good or, if we're at the, it's sort of like it's reached Trumpian levels. Like, we have to argue about the weather, or we have to argue about um, uh, that kind of stuff. We've reached a really weird place, I think. 
Um, and now he had to resign, uh, obviously, yeah. and we'll see yeah. who they put in his place. But I think this thing goes a lot further because a lot of these dinners that Jeffrey Epstein was at, organized by another group called TheEdge.org, which he had given a ton of money to, um, you know, you had Gates there, you had uh, Sergey Brin, you had Larry Page, you had Marissa Mayer. They all sort of were, not to like, they didn't hang out with Epstein all the time, but it's just like a really interesting sort of weird, um, very male-centered um, environment where things just get passed over. And it was, you know, there was clear, there was clearly um, very few women, very few people of color, very few, very few diversity. It was sort of this weird little club and he managed to like take his reputation and rewash it. So anyway. But I wonder if the bigger story, I don't know if this is as much a negative indicator on tech as it is on higher education. Yeah. And that is in the US, there's a direct correlation between your ranking as a university and the size of your endowment. So I know this firsthand. You're at NYU, Scott is at NYU. There's tremendous pressure to ra be raising money all the time. And you can see how these people, you, you, the institutions would, rationalize, you know, weak into ethics to raise more and more money. And it's, I think it all kind of reverse engineers down to this really terrible gestalt in the world of academia where we no longer see ourselves as public servants, we see ourselves as luxury brands. And we want to raise billions and billions of dollars, but we don't want to expand our freshman seats. So Stanford has triple the applicants for its freshman class, but they refuse to expand the number of seats each year such that people like me can stand up in faculty meetings and listen to our dean say we rejected 90% of our applicants and say it with, with pride, which in my view is tantamount to a homeless shelter bragging that they turned away 90% of the people who showed up last night. Money has totally, money and prestige has totally invaded or, uh, academia and we no longer, we think of ourselves as luxury brands. We've totally lost the script as opposed to public servants and it's a race to become the Vuitton or whatever the premier luxury brand yeah. is. And they need to, they need to tol we need to totally shift, in my view. I think we should start taxing endowments mm -hmm. unless you grow your seats faster than population. And we need yeah. to dramatically yeah. expand the number yeah. of seats. It's, uh, it, was, it will be interesting to see what happens at these companies, but it really does sort of, it's, it's not just MIT, it's Harvard. All it's, of them. It's you know, all of Stanford, us. Uh, USC keeps yeah. getting dragged into one yeah. horrible story after the next. And so what's interesting is a lot of these places are centers of tech or centers of like that where it's sort of, um, you know, you sort of wonder, to me the biggest question is what kind of influence did Epstein have? And he had some weird ideas about genetics, yeah. and, you know, because he wanted to actually use his sperm to create more Epsteins, which is horrible. Um, but he, he had, how much did it influence the actual science itself by yeah. who's funding it? And so it's the same idea of why are we taking our cues from very wealthy tech people. And I think Anand Girgardos talks about this is why do we go to someone like Mark Zuckerberg and let him determine how education should be reformed? Why don't we just tax him and then we decide? 100%. Which is fa fascinating. Anyway, why is, it's an interesting question. Why is, why is space why is space exploration and the cure of infectious disease now the domain or the sole domain of rich people? Yeah. I want NASA putting us in space, not fucking Elon Musk. Yeah. Why? It's, so it's very simple. And Tax. I'm a capitalist. You know, I don't, I, I've started companies. I think it's important that we have billionaires. It, we, it's literally gone to the point. Should we have people worth the GDP of Norway? Does that make any sense? Yeah. And so all of these unbelievable, inspiring things that we used to pull together around government, it has so many negative consequences because we can't pull together as a, a people, right? Curing disease is something we can all get behind and we can respect our government. We can all feel a collective investment in that. Putting a man on the moon is something we can all get behind. Now we've all got to worship at the, I call it the Pablo Escobar effect. He built parks. He cared about Colombia. Is that where we are? that only people who get money, you know, through what I think is fairly rapacious behavior and a lot of genius, they're the ones that build the parks because the rest of us can't afford it. We are, we are, we are becoming that nation. Yeah, I would agree with you. I don't think they should determine anything. Anyway, we're gonna get to winners and losers in a second. Um, and I think we'll put Apple, the Apple announcements, slow fees in that thing. Are you, we gonna do slow fees? I don't, I don't even know what that is. You don't even What's know what that is? Apple introduced a new thing on its camera, which has oh, been yeah. on other cameras called a slow fee which is a slow selfie. Uh. 
It's a new word. Th that event, I, by the way, I got invited to that event. I'm Me pretty too. sure just because of you. Yeah. But I watched some it of is. it. God, talk, about, talk about a yawn, the Apple event, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it, they did it, Apple TV Plus. They did announce. So that's very interesting. So Apple has announced. The rumor was they were going to spend a billion dollars on original content. They're going to spend six billion on original content. So they're just going to have their own programming. It's a great time to be in content right now. But what's interesting about Apple, and I think it goes to their strategy. The greatest unlock, I think, in business has been Prime, the ultimate loyalty program. More people have Prime than decorate a Christmas tree or voted in the last election. Right. The the second biggest just, unlock was Apple's decision to go vertical and control the distribution. And I think that it's very difficult to build a $100 billion value company now without controlling your distribution. And Apple did that. And Apple now is making this enormous investment, and their Apple TV isn't going to have... It's going to be $4.99, and you get it for free when you buy a new Apple product. You, this that? is the Rundles. This is Rundles. This is Rundles. They're Rundles are recurring revenue bundles. Recurring That's revenue his bundles. word. But what's interesting is HBO started with other people's TVs, and then they said, okay, let's create our own stuff. Netflix, other people's stuff, and House of Cards. Apple's flipping the switch, and they're starting only with original content, which is, you know, this is sort of it's raining. For, it's, it blows your mind to think about that. They'll spend $6 billion. HBO spends $2 billion. Netflix spends 14 Amazon spends 8 This year, there's going to be more money spent on original programming, television programming, than was spent in the entire decade of the 80s by everyone combined. Amazing. It is a great time to be into vaping and sitting on your couch and watching Netflix. Yeah, but <laughs> vaping. From what I've heard. From what I've heard. Vaping. Yeah, I President know. Trump is going after it because his wife has this son. For once, like Tiffany, you thought, not me this time. Um, anyway, but that was weird. But he's going after vaping. Amazing. Yeah. Banning flavors, which, which is probably a good thing. What are you going to do? What's that? What? Nothing. Yeah. Um, so, so let's get to winners and losers. I'm going to do the first win. Yeah. Obviously, Chrissy Teigen's Twitter feud with President Trump. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't make hashtag President Pussy Ash Bitch a trend. In the middle of the night, Trump tweeted about how John Legend and his, quote, filthy mouth wife had not right. given enough credit for his work in just criminal justice reform, but he messed with the wrong woman, obviously. Chrissy Teigen is an expert tweeter, and she called him a pussy-ass bitch. <laughs> and that's where we are in our presidential day. Nice. Uh, yeah. I he win? was busy with the Alabama stuff going on, like, yeah. for a long time, and then she, like, got his attention. Yeah, yeah. No, I, uh, yeah, that's where we are. Yeah, um, so she's a winner. She's a winner. I love Chrissy Teigen. I think she's a great uh, tweeter. Uh, I think she's funny, and she manages to – she doesn't keep it clean. That's not true. But yeah. uh, I think she does a great job, and I, I kind of am fascinated by his continued attacks, trying to best her, which is going gonna, gonna to end in tears for Donald Trump. So that's let's, my win. What's your win? Let's hope so. Uh, I, my win is uh, California – uh, is it the state legislator, the state senator, at AB5, saying AB5. that independent contractors or Uber driver partners, which is Latin for no health insurance, no minimum wage protection, they've decided that if you, uh, they've reclassified what it means to be an independent contractor. And they've said, okay, to be an independent contractor, you have con control of your own time. You have to kind of have your own business. And Uber drivers or partners could qualify as that, but you also can't be offering the service that is core to the business. And it's going to be very difficult for Uber to argue that the drivers aren't core to the business. And this is an enormous victory. If you see union membership's been cut in half. And it's pretty straight math. Everybody complains about the fact or we're like, how did, how did we get to this point where, you know, the bottom 50% of America has about the same wealth as seven families in America? And it's a direct correlation to the uh, kind of the absolute shit kicking that unions have had and the fact that, that we haven't ha really had a minimum wage raise in about 30 years. So this is, I'd like to think that this is a firewall, well, that we'll this see. is well, us we'll saying see. You know, I've, Gavin Newsom, who just signed it into law, Uber says it doesn't apply to them, or is making the argument that it doesn't apply to their contractors. Oh, they've already funded, uh, significantly funded, they've allocated 20 or $30 million along with some other companies, DoorDash, et cetera, to fight this and take it to the Supreme Court. Yeah. But it's, it's time. I mean, it's, it's absolutely time 
for you know workers to rise up and for us to you know well, I'm a, it's I'm also a will ruin union. their business plans even further yeah. like and I you know one of the best interviews I've ever done in terms of getting someone to say something just awful um, which is my goal in every interview um, was when Travis Kalanick who was the previous uh, CEO and one of the founders of, yep. of Uber um, I asked him what I said you know your business has some financial difficulties in yeah. getting profitable yeah. And he goes, well, you know, when, when we, the problem I have is that guy in the front seat. I'd like to get rid of him. Yeah, he's the and cost. He's a, he's a cost. And once right. I get rid of him, I have a great business. Yeah. And I was like, what? And the whole audience went, what? Yeah. And I'm like, like you say, go on. Yeah. Um, and he just, it was fascinating for him to like admit because he was evil, and that's what a villain does in a Bond movie. Um, so I'm going to kill you now, Mr. Bond, by cutting you with a laser in six parts. So, um, so it was really interesting, but I think that, that they are not going to be able to outrun this. Do you? I don't think they will. No, I don't, I don't Unless they so. get rid of the guy in the front seat, really. Yeah, and, and let's, go to, let's go to our losers. 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 Uh, so um, and this is a, a, a loss and a win. Okay. Um, I think Amazon and Twitter, with continued lack of regard for the Commonwealth, the Business Roundtable put out this wordy statement saying, mm -hmm. it's no longer just about shareholders, it's about stakeholders. And 50, 70, 80 years ago, companies were evaluated. It was prestigious to have a lot of employees. That was prestigious. It was prestigious to be seen as a really good citizen, it's paying your people well. Those were signs, those were markers, not just your share price. People probably had a stronger view of the company based on those things and didn't know what the share price is. And we've seen Twitter uh, basically file suit in San Francisco refusing to pay that tax. Yep. Uh, going after that, I think that's a big lose. And I think also Amazon, you want to talk about heroes, and I brought this up a lot. Amazon supposedly got very angry at questions around unionization and the pushback they got from local officials here in New York. And so they quote unquote took their ball and went home and they pulled out of New York. Remember that? That was six months ago. Yeah. LinkedIn is amazing. You can go on LinkedIn and you can scrape data and you get a ton of insight. Apple has about 15 or 20 open job positions. Google, 100 open job positions in New York. Amazon has 800 open job positions in New York right now. In the last six months since Amazon pulled out, they've increased their hiring. They've hired 1,000 people at Amazon in the last six months. They've hired 500 people at AWS. That means they are on pace to bring those 25,000 jobs Right? Why? Because Jeff Bezos was always coming here, a 54-year-old man with $160 billion, wants to roll in New York, not Indianapolis or Denver or Columbus, Ohio. That was ridiculous to begin with. And guess what? They are bringing those jobs here to the greatest city in the world. And you know what? That guy had to put his fucking hand back in his pocket. AOC State Senator Giannara saved us all $3 billion by saying, you know what, boss? You're coming here. This is the greatest place in the world. We do not need to pay you for your midlife crisis. This is a huge victory for us. Indeed. I love when you go all AOC on me. It's really nice. Not so much when you go other ways, but there I like AOC. But it's true, absolutely true. They didn't, we don't need to pay them. Like the idea that we, that we subsidize. I don't know about all of you. I'm paying a lot to be here. Yeah. Aren't you paying a lot? You pay to be in New York. You're right, exactly. All right, my fail is uh, Trump tweeting, all this tweeting about Alabama, yeah. uh, the tweeting about uh, running in the election for 2024, and don't you lo just love when presidents talk about subverting the Constitution, um, which is just Wednesday for us in the United States anymore. Um, and that, you know, the whole Alabama thing, it was insanity. That the only thing I was sort of like didn't know how to feel about was the whole John Bolton tweets because I hate John Bolton. So I was like, who do I vote for here? Like, who do I root for? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I'm That's like, right. he's out. oh, I really think that. Trump's an asshole, but that guy is a real, he's been a persistent asshole for 20 years. Um, so it's a real, it was an interesting, that was my thing. But this, the, the tweeting about this is not, it's really weird. It, it's, I think looking at his mental illness is something we need, well, we know this already, but I think it needs to be taken seriously by journalists to start to. Can I have a second win? What? I think yeah. there's a lot of good things going on right now. I'm really right. hopeful, and I'm not. I mean, All right. I don't, I, then we're going to go to questions. Or I hate my life less here. and less every day. But the repudiation of Boris Johnson uh, bypassing yeah. Parliament. Yeah. So the he lied the, to the Queen. One of the things I, I don't like about being a Democrat, or I don't like about us, is I think we're wimps. So Fox Talks has a week called Socialism versus Capitalism. They're constantly calling us socialists. 
And I think it's time we started saying, you know what, now, we're not socialists. As a matter of fact, the worst type of socialism is cronyism, which is happening on the other side. I think we need to say no, and I'm hoping that we're having sort of a reverse D-Day when the British Parliament, when the Conservative Party there, 23 members defect and go to the other side, which we haven't seen among Republicans here, with this what I'll call soft fascism. And let's be, cl let's be clear, this is a soft form of fascism. Fascism is nationalism, or demonizing immigrants, or refusal to condemn violence. And that, to me, perfectly describes some of the actions that are happening across the extremist right wing in Europe and the US. So yeah, you call me a socialist. No, no, boss, you're the fascist. And Britain just said no. And I hope that begins to infect us. Will we start to push back yeah. on a president who's taking money out of our defense budget without, without a discussion or legislation or any sort of discourse with our legislative body? And that Boris Johnson tried to do the same thing in the UK, and they yep. said, not mm -hmm. here, boss. Not and we here. need to do the same thing here. I, we need less I, fascism. I like, I like you in a lesbian. You, you've gone full lesbian, which is really nice. I wish that lesbian Lindsey Graham would do that. What? Come on. That's good. Jesus. That's good. Like, literally, I'm like, I think everyone has the photos or something that's going on there. Anyway, um, come on. Let's go. We're going to have questions from the audience. All right. Marianne, in the audience, I don't know where you are. What can large tech platforms, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera, do to protect vulnerable communities while not accidentally preventing members of the community from reclaiming what used to be hateful slurs? What can they do? Do you want to go first? No, you go. Um, I think as long as there's a dollar bill at the end of it, they're not going to. Uh, I don't think we can expect, we can call on their better angels. I think they've shown a masterful delay in obfuscation with uh, like a faux concern. And uh, we continue to see that here's the, here's the problem, the underlying business model and the algorithms. As a species, we like to think we're a generous, empathetic people, and there's a large vein of that but we're more tribal than we are generous or empathetic. And we're very drawn to violence and conflict. And it's the ultimate business model to create a model where we're conflict. So when we talk about engagement on these platforms, what we really mean is enragement. So there's an economic interest in letting anti-vaxxers go on and talk about this stuff without stepping in and saying, you know what, this is not only not true, it could potentially be very harmful. Right? It could result in an outbreak of meningitis or what have you. And so they will always, they will always default to, well, okay, rage and hate. We're worried about it. We're concerned about it. We'll do but better. don't get in the way of it. Yep. So the bottom line is we need legislation. Yep. We pay 23 cents on the dollar to D.C. and to our state governments such that they can prevent a tragedy of the commons. And these companies will never make that connection. So what we need to do are elect officials that hold them to the same standards and scrutiny. We've held other industries and companies. But folks, they're not going to get they're there not. on their own. When it's raining money, your vision, your vision gets blurred. Absolutely. I agree with you on that one. All right. What will happen to Lyft and Uber drivers? Because well, you do predictions mostly. So what will happen to Lyft and Uber drivers? Well, I think all of us probably need to take fewer Ubers. You know, I don't know. I don't know if it makes sense for a professor to be taking a suburban or whatever I'm going to be taking for 80 bucks. I should probably be angry that it takes so long to get to the airports and vote for people and be willing to pay taxes such that there's public transportation to these places, you know, like they've done in Europe for the last 50 years. Right. So I'd like to think the workers get a little bit more dignity, the wages go up, that we go to minimum wage. By the way, remember all, this, all the fear mongering about what happens if you raise minimum wage to 15 bucks? Yeah. That hasn't panned out anywhere. No. Hasn't panned out anywhere. So I, I hope, I hope it just across the board, the gig workers and everybody else just- That this the California legislation money. goes national. Yeah, do you think it's gonna happen? I do, do. I do. I think, you know, it's interesting. I did have a discussion with Gavin Newsom when he was Lieutenant Governor and he didn't have anything to do all day. So he'd have lunch with me. Yeah. Um, we talked about this a lot, this idea of reclassifying workers and creating a new kind of worker. Um, so I do think this, I think California, I'll be writing about this next week in the New York Times, is really the de facto national legislator for everything. Um, or whether it's yeah. a privacy bill, whether it's this AB5 with the car deal, the deals they're making with car. So I think in weird way, Gavin Newsom and the, and the Senate there is determining a lot of our regulations for tech. 
and Marguerite Vestager, who just got a giant job, and she got quantumly more scary for, uh, which she's fan she's a badass, speaking yeah. of badass women. Who here is in a union? Anybody here in a union? I when I was, yeah, I went to UCLA and every- I was, I was. At the you were journal, at a union? The, the journal, journal in the Washington Post, I'm not now, but. So junior year at UCLA, every summer at UCLA, I had basically 12 weeks to make 2,300 bucks so I could afford to go back to school. And I worked as a box boy at San Vicente Foods and this, this guy took an interest in me and he said, do this, do this, do this. And he had me fill out a bunch of paperwork. And he said, it's gonna cost you 80 bucks up front. I'm like, I don't have $80. He's like, we're putting you in the union. And I went from $4 an hour to $11 an hour. Like someone taking an interest in me and the mm -hmm. power of unions. And by the way, everybody seemed to be fine shopping in Bel Air at San Vicente Foods. And it literally paid for my junior year of college was a, somebody saying, there's, there's dignity in work and anyone who shows up here and packs other people's groceries should pay, get paid eight or nine bucks an hour in 1986 as opposed to yeah. four bucks an hour. And it, so I, you know, I got through my junior year of college and I think that needs to happen across millions of households. We need to raise, I mean, I'm really on my soapbox now, but it, I think yeah. it's, I would really love to see a reinvigoration of unions. Well, it's uh, interesting in that it's happening actually at internet media companies. What's that? It's, it, it, there's been unionization efforts more anywhere else than, well, the lot, but internet media companies, Vox had, went unionized. They're obviously working on it, BuzzFeed and, and Vice News and stuff like that. So it's a really interesting time because it's the, it's the media companies that are doing that, the internet media companies. Um, and I know it was a struggle at Vox, but they ultimately came to a deal with, uh, with the uh, unions and it was interesting. Um, but I, I also did, uh, uh, I, I'm not in the designation now for the Vox union, but um, but it, it's, it's an interesting trend. We'll see. Unions are, have been so kneecapped. It's kind of hard to imagine. They'll That's come what back. Have. All right, last two. 2020 tech IPO predictions, Scott Galloway. Uh, the biggest IPO or the most successful IPO of 2020 is going to be Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah. You and we're going to see. Are you bullish on this one? Or are you going to oh, slap them around? Airbnb is gangster. Airbnb is an incredible concept because with Uber, Uber has no moats, the core business has low margins, Airbnb is the exact opposite. Okay. You have to have global supply, that means you have to have people who, are, who know about Airbnb coming in from Copenhagen and Tokyo, so it has an incredible moat, it's well run, you, you like the CEO and the I do very much. There. They have issues around what they do to cities and removing rental properties at big cities, but in general, it, it, he's very aware of these things and he's not just saying, I, I, what I don't get from him is I get a really strong and interesting discussion yeah. and you can really shame him, which is always helpful. Um, but I find, I don't get a, you know, we'll do better. Yeah. We've made some mistakes, but we'll do better. What kind of internet do we want? What kind of internet do we yeah. want? First Amendment. I'm proud of our progress. Without knowing what the First Amendment is. What? Yeah. Uh, what? And, then, and then it's easier to pick the losers. Uber. Uber, Lyft, Tesla, Beyond Meat, all down 20 to 80% in 2020. How about you? What do you uh, think? I think uh, Airbnb. 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 Maybe Pinterest. Yeah. We'll see. You think they'll do well, Pinterest? I have no idea. Yeah. yeah. Pinterest. Yeah, you no like Pinterest? No idea. I haven't, I haven't paid attention to them in years. They've done so, well. Pinterest is yes, actually Pinterest, done well. Yes, Pinterest, I think. So we're going to be finishing up the last question here, and then I'm going to throw out some uh, I have some, uh, the, the Showtime people, uh, I'm actually friends with Eileen Shaken and others and Jennifer Beals and stuff like that. Um, this is their new- Put the mic next to it. This is their new Generation Q. I, I don't know what that is, but it's a kind of an odd t-shirt. I gotta say, I'm not sure if I'm down. I'm not sure if I'm down with it. I don't know which one's Jennifer and which one's Leisha. Anyway. Is the L word um, coming back? It's coming back. Right. Yes, hello. So I'm gonna throw the, all this stuff out because I got way too much sight. Again, I'm not, I'm not down with this. This is, all right, whatever, you know. And this is the worst one right here, but you may like it, I'll give it to you. Do you need one? When's the last, I wore one of these in the 80s, my friends. <laughs> but you can wear it if you want. I'm gonna throw them out, you don't get any of them. But the last question and then I'm gonna throw out this swag. Um, the gayest tech companies. There's almost no upside to me answering that. <laughs> you, you first, the gayest tech companies? The gayest tech companies. I just have no idea. No idea? I, I would not have no idea how to, you go first. Apple. <laughs> Here's why. Go Gay ahead. man. 
It's run by a gay man, too, but it wasn't before. What incredible progress. We now have one openly gay man in the Fortune 500. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, there's Rose Mercario. She's not, it's not a public company. She's the CEO of Patagonia. She's out. And 23 women. We're at 4%. What progress. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, I, you know, I always tell the joke about Apple. You know, they came out with this new phone, this new 11 phone. I don't know if I'm going to buy it or not. Um, but it's a... Uh, I always say, when, I, when I, I had a joke I told that I used to tell about Apple when it had, um, when they came out with the iPhone, um, iPhone, si uh, iPhone 6, right. and they, or the iPhone 10, yeah. and I said, oh, they can't, or I forget which one, iPhone 8, I said, oh, it's only a company that would call it the iPhone, um, wait, what was it? Oh, it was a great company about penises, um, joke about penises. Um, you know it's designed by a man, a man when they call it the iPhone 6, and it's 5.5 inches. So, something like that. Ba -bum -bum. Anyway, thank you so much. I'm going to throw out this thing. Who would like some L Word swag? Some, a lot of people, you know what I love? Lesbians always insulting the L words, and then all of them, whoa, don't kill yourself. Well done. Look at this. This is a, this, this I don't understand in any way whatsoever. You, right here, standing. Um, whoa, you got that?
founding a company. The realities of it, not what you uh, read about in press or what you see people posting to social media, actually what it is like daily, weekly, monthly. Out of interest, who here has started a company or is thinking at some point in their career it is something they would like to do? Yes, incredible, okay. I'm gonna lay it down, don't be too scared. There are highs and lows, but we're gonna go through it. Um, so my name's Robin, um, I'm the CEO and founder of Her. Her helps lesbian, bisexual, and queer people to meet each other. Um, and I was here six years ago, I think it was six years ago, um, at the first Lesbian City Tech New York, launching the app uh, for the very first time in New York City. Since then, we've grown the app to a community of four and a half million people. We run in 113 countries, uh, we run in three languages, we host events in 15 cities, host about 30,000 people per year, hosting a party in Brooklyn tonight, if you'd like to come. Um, uh, and uh, this journey that I've been on so far uh, was very different to the one that I expected. So uh, before I knew anything about startups, the world that I expected to walk into looked a little bit like, oh, no. It looked like, <laughs> it's the build up this. Um, and this was what I read about in press and millionaires and they're all on TV the whole time and that's what startups are. And it is lies. This is not what startups are. This will not be me. This will probably not be you. I don't want to crush your dreams, but most likely not. This is purely founder porn. It is uh, faux, hyped up, hyperbole, like just forget these people even exist. There was another set of like illusions that I had being a founder would be like, and this was based off of the like the roller coaster ride, the tech crunch disrupt, the press, the full of thirty under thirty. This stuff actually is kind of real. This stuff does happen. The difference is this only happens like one percent of the time that you are founding a company. Like. Ah, oh, it's not there, but the top left was me at uh, Lesbian Zoo Tech at the very first time pitching. We were pitching every couple of months. This was me at TechCrunch Disrupt. Um, this was this amazing press story that someone wrote about us. And this is the stuff that I share on social media because you're like, awesome, this looks amazing. But 99% of the time, things like this are being written about you. This was three months ago. A dating app equipment exists, but nobody's using it. Um, uh, and guess what? You don't share that stuff to social media. So I want to tell you about like, uh, what that 99% looks like, what my almost like emotional experience has been of going through that, and then practical tips of how I recommend dealing with that. So uh, when I was trying to think of uh, a way to describe it, I was thinking about everything. The closest I could get to what it feels like founding a company is your first love. Um, and the reality is her has been my greatest love. It has been the greatest of moments and literally the worst of moments I have known in my life. Um, uh, and so uh, the first thing I will describe about uh, love and founding is you're doing it all the time. Um, there are two components to this. One is uh, the first two years of founding your company, it's, it's the greatest resource that you have. You spend so much time dedicated to this company. I used to take off one weekend at um, every month. Every other weekend I was working, it's, you lose commitments with family and friends, but I believe it requires that huge investment of time to really start building something great. And if you do build something great, it's probably gonna take 10 years of your life to build something brilliant. And I think most people don't realize that when they have this idea that's like, the cool app that I wanna build for travel. It's like, do you wanna do that for 10 years through all this hardship? And I think it's really important to think about that commitment that you are possibly signing up to. The next thing about love and startups is that you're somewhat deluded and somewhat was actually being generous because the reality is you are highly deluded. Um, uh, these are just a snippet of my delusions. Uh, the first one was, no one has done this before. Loads of people have done this before. I just chose to not like uh, respect that, listen to it, and it decided to live with the greatest delusion was that, but they're all doing it wrong. Those that have, they just don't understand. I understand. Match.com, they don't understand. Like, no, these are smart people that run these businesses. They do, there is a reason they've made those decisions. This is where delusion can actually be a great asset to you because the delusion that I had around that actually like catalyzed me to start doing this and I figured out a lot of stuff along the way. So the key with delusion is just to know what's the good delusion and what's the bad delusion. A bad delusion uh, was me thinking in fundraising, I just need to get a lead because I had like six different investors that said to me they were in if I just got a lead. This is 
deluded. If an investor is interested in you after a meeting or after a partner meeting, they will let you know within 48 hours. And if you don't hear from them, they're not interested. Get over it, move on. You have to hold yourself accountable to these kind of practical tips. And it sits alongside with hiring. Like you can string along ideas for hiring someone for so long convincing yourself they're gonna cross the line with you. If they don't reply to you within 48 hours and they are not pushing it forward themselves, they are not interested, stop deluding yourself and move forward. You're getting distracted all the time. Uh, this, I think, is one of the most challenging parts of being a founder, that there are literally a thousand things that you could be doing at any given moment. So uh, you're balancing your time between uh, all the tasks that you need to do, the amount of time you have to do them, the money you have to be able to execute, and the advice that is pouring in of how you manage this. I thoroughly recommend using an OKR system to run your company, um, objectives and key results, in a startup, I recommend doing this on a one-month basis. Um, at shorter time frames, you set one big objective, like make money, and you set key results that will do it. How do we know we've done it? We've closed $1,000 in revenue. It aligns your whole team on one single key focus. Hire people that are better than you. If you are gonna focus on running this company, hire people that you actually allow properly to focus on running other parts of your business. Don't do their job for them. Step back, let them be great. And the one thing that I recommend as a founder you have to be great at is hiring and firing. It is the one consistent thing in your company that you will always be doing and it is exceptionally hard. Hiring, take every opportunity. Hire is hiring for product designers and Android engineer and growth marketers. Please apply to me after this conference. Um, uh, firing, you know in your gut when it's wrong, you know it's not working out. Stop deluding yourself and thinking that this is gonna work. Talk about it honestly and move past a relationship that's not working out inside of your company. This is the classic one that comes from relationships, but I truly believe it is what makes great companies. Communication with yourself and with other people is absolutely critical. Um, uh, this was the hardest thing for me. Brits aren't the best communicators. So uh, I've done this as a very practical list of tips because this is how I tried to learn to be better. Repeat everything 10 times. You think you're telling your team what to do until you have said it 10 times, they will not hear it. If you say something more than once, write it down. I wish I'd done this earlier. We now use Notion as like a hold wiki. If you're saying any instructions, any task more than once, put it in there. It will be so valuable moving forwards. Manage your contacts. Also wish I'd done this at the beginning. Start building your own personal CRM and classify the people that you meet. It will pay you dividends down the line. Make clear agreements. So many times I'll have one-on-ones with people in my team and uh, I think we're making agreements, but turns out we have the next week's meeting and I'm like, but you didn't do that thing. And they're like, well, you told me 15 things. So how do I know which one I'm actually supposed to do? Be explicit, make clear agreements. It will be so much more productive. Speak your unspoken. This is uh, a hard one for me to figure out, but a lot of the time you're managing people and working with people and you realize you're like not happy with how stuff is going, but you're not fully acknowledging it to yourself. The earlier you can recognize what you are thinking about good performance or bad performance or goals, and the earlier you can say that to someone you're sat in front of, the more effective your whole team and your whole business will end up being. Um, share your vulnerabilities. Um, I think people have a story that founders should be like fierce and tough and bold and always like ruling the company and it actually can end up creating quite a large disconnect between you and your team. The greatest way to build a sense of community and trust from your team with yourself is to share this stuff in an appropriate like, way that you are feeling vulnerable about, that you are scared about, but that you hope that you guys are gonna achieve as a company. It's made a huge change inside our team since we started talking about this a lot more. Um, and lastly, just like learn humans. Um, I was very n not self-aware when I started her um, and I just thought everyone works like me. Uh, turns out they don't. Um, understand different types of people and what drives them, what motivates them. Understand your team, the individuals, like what's gonna get them hype, what makes them feel disappointed and how do you help them navigate that and work through it because you're all in this together. Um, the last, the second to last thing is, uh, this journey is relentless. It, um, if it is 10 years, buckle up. Like there is a lot that you're gonna go through. And I think founding a company, it is, it is all consuming. Um, you're second guessing yourself a lot of the time because you're just making this shit up. Like who actually knows what you are supposed to be doing? Um, uh, 
it can be isolating, especially I'm a single founder. Um, uh, there isn't that like co-founder relationship to lean into. And you lose a sense of self in that your identity basically becomes your company. Everything, every dinner party you go to, every bar you're at when you're chatting to someone, what's your job, what's your job? It's, it becomes everything that you are used to talking to about yourself. And it can have a really um, risky impact, I think, on founders' mental, mental health, which is being spoken about a bit more at the moment. My practical solutions for this, for me, have been working out, taking care of your body is a really important, uh, healthy um, uh, place to be in. Um, uh, sleep starts to take care of your mind. Meditation, for those that do it, really can help take care of your mind. And I'm British, and so I drink to take care of my mind. I think it is the best medicine that exists. Um, and uh, lastly, build a support group. It's very practical, and it's been the most valuable thing for me. A group of three to four other founders who I can text for like, I need a hiring agreement for this thing. Do you have it? Or I don't know what to do about this person. People that tr you trust and know your business and know how to advise you. And even more important than that, find someone that is two years further down the line than where you are, because they are going to be the most invaluable like a source of information, advice, and guidance that you can get hold of. Find that person, latch onto them, don't lose them. Um, uh, and the last thing is uh, love and startups is fueled by passion. Uh, it starts from a passion like uh, that you probably don't really understand. You see it as an idea and you don't really understand what's driving you. But I really recommend understanding for you as a founder, figuring out what drives your passion. If your passion comes from a desire to achieve, if it comes from a desire to serve, if it comes from a desire for recognition, for impact, figure out what makes you push harder than you've ever known that you could to like get up after every hard moment and keep driving a team, driving yourself, coming up with new ideas, figure out where that passion sits and you'll need to tap into that again and again and again. So if you want to found a company, you need to do it all the time. You need to stay deluded. I'm saying don't lose it. Just recognize what's good delusion and bad delusion. Don't get distracted. It's Biggest responsibility as a founder, keep yourself focused and your team focused. Communicate everything more than you know, more than you thought you ever needed to. Be relentless. Quo women are fucking relentless. This is our special skill set. Take that, harness it, and use it to drive your company. And remain passionate, because uh, these things are filled with love and passion. Thank you very much. Well done. Well done. start by telling you a story. So in 2003, Steve Jobs' team was designing one of the first Apple flagship stores that was going to go on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And we take it for granted now because there's an Apple store in every city, usually a handful of them, a lot of suburban malls as well. Um, but at this time, it was one of the very first flagship stores. They were just starting their retail experience. And so there was a lot that was riding on the success, su success of this project for the brand. So the team, of course, was really nervous. They had spent months working on getting the details of it just right. They brought it proudly into his office, a little miniature model of it, laid it on his desk, and he looked at it and got really mad. And he walked out of the room. He stomped out of the room. And so the team is left looking at each other, not knowing what happened, definitely not having expected that outcome. And a few minutes later, he runs back in, he's got a pail full of water, and he tips it upside down and dumps it on top of the model. So it's soaking wet. And the team's looking at him like, what the? And he said, this store is going in Chicago, and it snows there from October to May. So more than half of the time that consumers experience our brand there, this store is going to be soaking wet. So if we're going to talk about what the customer experience looks like, it better be dredged.
Sorry, trying to figure out how to aim this clicker. So here's a picture of it. I have news for all of you. You think you're in technology, but you're also in marketing. Every single one of us in this room is in marketing. Everyone has to think about the consumer all day long, every, every day. The only way that you're going to ensure that whatever you're building and designing and creating is going to be successful is if you stop very early in the process and then often along the, the way to re-anchor yourself on who is the consumer, who am I building this for, what do they care about, what's difficult for them, and how you're fixing some of those problems or how you're adding value to their life. It's the only way to ensure that you're successful. So you didn't know you had a second job. That's the bad news. The good news is nobody in your company knows you have that second job. You're a technologist. It is table stakes for you to know how to code, to architect networks. Nobody in your company expects you to think about the consumer. That's marketing shop. There's teams of people thinking about that. But if you always focus what you're doing on the consumer, even as a technologist, number one, you're going to ensure your, your technology is successful. You're building a great experience for your consumer. Two, it's going to sell. And three, you're going to be completely differentiated from your peer set. You're going to look like a superstar. My name's Gretchen Saig Fleming. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at L'Oreal USA. Yes, I am also a lipstick lesbian. I've been waiting for the right crowd to use that line on, and I thought <laughs> this was going to be it. I am not a technologist. I don't have the expertise that you have. But I do work hand in hand every day with my tech partners to create absolutely groundbreaking experiences for consumer and beauty. So I'm going to show you a few examples. About a year ago, L'Oreal bought a technology company, which was groundbreaking in beauty. We buy brands, we buy products. Um, as an organization, L'Oreal has 35 brands. I manage a portfolio of 35 brands. We acquired 34 of them, the first one being L'Oreal Paris. Why did we acquire a technology company? That sounds strange. We bought a company called Modiface. Has anyone heard of it, used it? OK, a few of you. It's a virtual reality 3D makeup try-on technology. It's augmented reality and it's part of, uh, it's fueled by artificial intelligence. And we made that investment because fundamentally we believe, and we think we're right, that that, exp that digital experience is going to help solve consumer challenges in beauty that have ex existed for decades. Think about it. You always want to get the right eyeshadow shade for your lipstick shade. You don't necessarily know that. Um, and you might be asking yourself, Do I am I going to look good as a redhead? That's a decision that you don't want to get wrong the next day. <laughs> so let's take a look. I don't know if we can get sound. You guys will get the point. Bear with it. It's a, it's a little slow and it's a little lo-fi. Um, because this is actually a consumer using it. This was just shot for my iPhone. So speaking of getting your shade right, today's diverse beauty consumer, it really expects that we're going to be able to provide them exactly the right shade. Um, and that's in color. Uh, but it is also in foundation. Um, and before I get onto that part, what I will say we've learned from the Modiface experience is in store, consumers try on one, maybe two lipsticks. Same with eyeshadow. And not usually on their face, because what if they don't like it? They don't want to walk around with it for the rest of the day. They usually are just swatching it on their hand. So in fact, the digital experience is much better than the in real life experience in store. That is crazy that technology has evolved to that point. It's really incredible that that's what I get to do every day. Consumers digitally are trying on 13 shades of lipstick. And I'm only a data point of one, but I was definitely more adventurous 
digitally than I would be in real life. There is no way in real life that I would try on a deep navy blue lipstick. Has anyone done that, by the way? Has anyone rocked a navy blue lipstick? All right, good for you, girl. <laughs> Nick's uh, Velvet Matte Midnight Muse. It was awesome. But I would never have known that without that digital experience. And our consumers are telling us that they really love this experience too. They're spending twice as long as our, on our websites as they were before, and they're twice as likely to purchase. Pretty incredible. So I'm gonna to talk to you about another tech-fueled personalization story around foundation. Uh, diverse consumers, we used to sell uh, foundation shades and under eye concealers and things like that in a light, medium, and dark. We're not a light, medium, dark world. We're a whole spectrum. And so now we've evolved to a place where our IT Cosmetics brand has 48 shades of under eye concealer. And even beyond that, Lancome's Le Ton Particulier, yes, I do have a French tutor, <laughs> can custom design a shade just for you. You guys are really killing me with the no music. <laughs> there is sound and it is peppy and that was more energetic than you got to experience it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't win them all. Um, all right, let's talk about skin care. Skin care, how's technology fueling personalization in skin care? Going back to what we know fundamentally about our consumer, today's beauty consumer is absolutely obsessed with overall wellness. And that's been an evolution over the last five years or so. Um, consumers used to focus on how they look, now they're focusing on how they look, how they feel, and how their health is. And so the category of beauty has been expanding. And we know about 60% of our consumers, based on the market research we do, want a personalized diagnosis just for them, just for their skin. How can they look and feel better? So our research and innovation labs built the first ever battery-free sensor to help you look and feel better with your personalized diagnosis based on data. Let's take a look. This one has a different jazzy music. So with the launch of the La Roche-Posay My Skin Track, L'Oreal became the first beauty product ever sold in an Apple store. You guys were wondering how I was going to close the loop on the Apple store. So L'Oreal is the number one beauty company in the world and our, our innovation and our deep roots in science have fueled our growth for the last 100 years. We're a 100 plus year old company. And that spirit of innovation and building something new and unexpected has historically been focused on and will continue to be focused on incredible products, new textures, new formulations, and now technology is giving us the opportunity to leapfrog that and layer really incredible personalized experiences on top of that. So going back to my original point, your second job you didn't know about. Every single one of us is a marketer. 
every single one of us has to put the consumer at the heart of what we're doing. And if you do that, you're going to ensure that your technology is a success. Okay, that's great, but pragmatically, what, what do you need to do on your next project? Two simple things. One, become absolutely obsessed with customer experience. Any of you do UX testing? UX testing is your new religion. Become obsessed with everything that you learn that is wrong or could be improved and relentless about making it better. For those of you that don't use UX testing, usertesting.com is simple, inexpensive, so accessible, use it. Try to buy your products yourself. You run an e-commerce website, you try, to, you try to place an order and the zip code field doesn't recognize where you live, you can't check out. If you don't know that, you can't fix it. Read all the ratings and reviews, not just the ones that make you feel good about yourself. Those are actually useless. I mean, it's nice. But the ones that really sting, those are the ones that you need to spend all of your time on because they're what's going to propel you to make it better. Number two, make a best friend in marketing. If your company has a consumer insights function, make a best friend with someone on that team. The chief information officer at L'Oreal USA is my work husband. Yes, my wife knows that and she's relatively supportive. <laughs> when you marry someone, you, you care about what they care about. You spend time understanding what their problems are and how to solve them. You help them solve problems together. So get a work spouse that gets the consumer. And if you can keep the consumer at everything at the heart of what you do, you are guaranteed to stand out and you're guaranteed to be successful. I'm Gretchen Sag Fleming. I'm the CMO of L'Oreal USA and I am hiring. And before I leave you, just one comment on a very notable perk, which is the job comes with all the lipstick you can wear. <laughs> and if that's not your thing, that's cool too. Your friends and family are going to love it. <laughs> Thanks. It's really cold out there, isn't it? <laughs> I was sitting in the audience this morning, I was just like freezing. <laughs> so thank you for uh, freezing and staying here to listen to me talk uh, about how to scale. So I have 12 minutes to tell you how to scale your technology and your organization and grow your business. Um, that's not nearly enough time. <laughs> so I'm just gonna tell you a few things. Um, but primarily it's about building small things. And that's nice, because that's the thing that we can really grasp, and we can fit that into 12 minutes. And Axios, I'm all about smart brevity too here, so this actually works out really well for me. Um, but you're gonna see that a lot of my metaphor here is around flocking like birds uh, or fish. If you think about how animals work together in communities, they don't necessarily have a leader. They don't necessarily have someone who directs them, but they figure it out. And this is through small behaviors. Uh, there was a really great uh, book uh, published a while back by Stephen Wolfram called um, A New uh, Kind of Science. And it was all about these little tiny behaviors, little tiny mechanisms, little, uh, just a few rules that produce incredibly complex and really interesting results. And I think that that's what it takes to create things that scale, is you can't fundamentally do that patriarchy kind of thing and assume that you can just direct the entire thing from the top down. No, you need to create systems that work. You need to enable people. You need to push autonomy. So what does that look like in the lens of product? Well, avoid king customers. This is the one customer who comes in and directs your entire roadmap and is like, oh, do this thing because I want this. And you're, 
There's so much uh, drive to get revenue from that one big customer that they can really come in and uh, set you down the wrong path. So it's really important to try to have lots of smaller customers. It's a really nice thing to think about. Solve most people's pain, not everyone's pain, because you understand better um, the jobs that you understand that people need to get done than you can understand everything else. And so start on the small things, get really good at them, and scale that out. We've seen that work really well with things like Basecamp. Basecamp just tries to be something that's very tight and focused and small and delivers uh, a hugely valuable product to the market by staying really focused. That's really helpful. And always be validating your products. It's really important to get things out in front of people, to try little iterations, to get feedback quickly so that you can grow in the right direction. It's hugely important. In the technology lens, uh, this is really more about building small services. The I, whole idea of microservices has been such uh, a buzzword in the industry um, because it actually works when you get it right. It introduces a different kind of complexity, but it's fundamentally complexity that we understand how better to manage from te as a technology, as technologists. Uh, we know how to create things that monitor service interactions. We know how to create dashboards. We know how to create um, anomaly detection systems. Those are solvable problems, and those are patterns that we can reestablish throughout the industry, as opposed to cre trying to create one giant application that does everything. We don't have common patterns in industry to apply to those applications. You have to create the systems that help you keep track of that yourself. So build small things. Watch how they work. Think, focus on the messages and the interactions between those small things. If you can get the kinds of APIs right between your services, if you can be really clear about um, what each thing is supposed to do, then those things are going to work better together, and you can combine those into a, an entire system that really delivers a lot of value. I'm a big fan of going forwards too fast. <laughs> there we go. I'm a big fan of contract testing. That's fascinating. Who's in control of this one? I don't know. <laughs> Ghost in the clicker. Um, I'm a big fan of contract testing. Uh, this is a system called Pact, for example, that enables you to create uh, a contract between a client and a service in the technology that you're using. I'm just going to like not keep waving this around. So uh, I'm a big fan of Pact. It allows you to create a well-defined contract between a client and a service that you can execute as code. It's, uh, it produces uh, a set of files you can put in your test suite. You can then execute it every time. And as soon as something changes between the client or the service, you get a test failure. As long as you're using continuous integration, you can catch that, and you can solve for it more effectively. So it tends to help this kind of service uh, expectation work out really well. Another thing that's worked uh, really well a lot of times is uh, broadcasting uh, your data, but not just broadcasting your data like over Kafka or some sort of service bus or like RabbitMQ, but use schemas for that kind of data broadcast. We, uh, I'm a big fan of Avro for this. Avro is a way to format data and validate uh, that it works because you effectively can't even, uh, it's a binary data format. You can't even encode it to binary without using the schema, and you can't decode it well without using the schema. So you know that every message that you get is going to be the same kind of message as long as it conforms to the schema, and there's a whole process for schema evolution. Again, I've only got a few minutes here to talk about all the different things, but it's a really great system. So what you end up doing is that every service in the application broadcasts what's going on, what's important potentially to the rest of the services, but really to the future of the business. And what this does is it enables you to create a data stream of what's happening that you can then add additional consumers to that data down the road and create new value. This is famously what Amazon did with AWS, is they focused in the very early days on forcing everything to be a really well-documented API and to be internally public. And then what they did over time is that they kept adding services that would consume those other services because they focused hard on the APIs, on the messages, and on the interactions between systems. And this enabled them to add more value over time really well. And then focusing on resilience again, 
this is speaking again to how do we monitor all these little tiny things. Make sure that each one of them is really uh, failure tolerant, that it can handle change effectively. Um, I'm a big fan of chaos engineering. Uh, this is using things like Chaos Monkey to go in and knock your service over and see what happens and make sure that it recovers effectively. So making sure you spend time on that enables you to grow the organization really effectively. All right, we're going <laughs> to try this here again. <laughs> Finally, the, one of the most important parts of scaling, in fact, I think still the most important, is the kinds of systems you put in place to enable people to be effective, to self-organize as much as possible, and to deliver on the value of the organization. The number one thing in, in my world for this is the squad model. Um, Spotify famously created a whole ton of uh, documents and videos around their model. Um, God, jeez. <laughs> Put that back down. <laughs> Uh, the net is that you create small teams that build a ton of internal trust and safety that enable them to own problem domains with some boundaries that you have to create to run an organization, but you enable people to own a problem domain to ship products that solve those problems, and then you try to get out of their way as much as possible. You give them as much context as you can, like, well, we really need this thing because we only have this much revenue, for example, or we need to use these technologies because we expect it to integrate in this way in the future, but what the product is that the team creates, how they solve it, that's really up to them. That's really important because my job is to hire really smart, really effective people to give them the context and then to give them the space and the freedom to generate the results and to frankly reward them for contributing to all of our success. That's really, really important to me. So the squad model really drives it. My squads are typically a product manager, a designer, usually three to five engineers, a quality engineer, and sometimes a data scientist, and it depends on the squad. Uh, and so in together that's like, the two pizza rule, if you've heard of that. Uh, it's a small number of people who can make decisions together. There's no manager in the squad. It's as flat as possible. There's some defined ways that, to get them started on making decisions, but fundamentally then they take over decision making between them. They create shared agreements and they drive towards success together. Uh, I hold them collectively accountable to delivering high quality results. Uh, it's really important that we don't focus on this person or this person because together as a team, they make it work or they don't. Uh, another really important part of that, to create the right kind of trust and safety in a team, is this idea of 10x engineers. Uh, that someone can come in and be a 10x engineer. Every time I've seen this happen, what they've been doing is they've been forgetting tests, they've been forgetting documentation, they've been breaking systems along the way. They've just been delivering what needs to be done today with no thought for the future. And sometimes, you know, delivering what needs to be done today is the right choice, but if we all make that together, that's one thing, as opposed to one person going rogue, shutting themselves into a closet, and not being able to be talked to. That's definitely what I want to avoid. So it's very important that we find people who want to work together. Pair programming is a huge thing for me. I don't mandate it, but I do love it because I think it helps knowledge share among people. It helps people work together to, to solve problems and find collective solutions. And it creates that, that team spirit that I think really drives effective decision making. Um, Mission alignment and cross-training. This is again towards the, the, the pairing, but also a really important thing is that I hire people who care about my mission as an organization, who are self-motivated to, in my case, get people smart fast with what matters every day. That's a really important thing for me, and it's a really important thing for everyone in my team. Uh, and so if they care about getting people smart fast with what matters, then they're going to think about that all the time. I won't have to tell them, you should get people smart fast with what matters. You should, <laughs> they're gonna be caring about them themselves. And so then for me, it's more about, well, get people smart fast with what matters on an app or on a website or things like that. And that's the kind of context that I can set and help them be directed and effective. And, and finally, it's really important for me, again, like I said many times here, to coach and not direct people. I wanna bring out the best in everyone in my teams. I wanna enable them. I want to support them and I want to grow them. And I don't necessarily have all the answers. I can add my experience to the table and I can talk about my own you know, perspectives, but fundamentally I've hired great people and I want to help them be effective. And so uh, if someone's going off into left field uh, and I want to bring them back in, my job is to share with them my perspective. Like, why do I think they're out off base? Why do I perceive them as going in the wrong direction? What is happening? And how can I help them see the context that I see? And hopefully, maybe I can learn something, and maybe they can learn something too, and together we can create a much better solution. So, 
Thank you very much. I'm Jess Schmeider. I, I'm the CTO at Axios. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn or wherever at jschmeida. Uh, feel free to email me. And thank you so much. All right, folks, how you doing? We have one more fabulous conversation before we break for lunch. Are you so excited? So as they set up, welcoming to the stage is Swati Vothran, who is the VP of Engineering at BuzzFeed. And we're going to do a little Ask Me Anything. I feel like I'm talking to myself. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. So um, I'm going to kick things off and then I'm going to open it up to you all in the audience to ask some questions. And there should be somebody that will be uh, walking around that has a microphone. So when you do have a question, just raise your hand and then they will make their way over to you. Sound good? Yeah. Fabulous. Okay, so Swati, tell me, girl, how did you get into engineering? So I actually followed what we now call a traditional background. Uh, you know, I, I did computer science um, undergrad. Uh, I started off as a software engineer. Um, and that's sort of how I got into this. You know, I, I, I did the, that traditional route, um, which now is now so, sometimes an exception. It's amazing to see how in our industry there are so many people getting into tech not with, with a non-traditional background, and we love that. So you are a woman and a woman of color. Can you talk to us about some of the challenges, or maybe you haven't faced any challenges, but some of the things that you have faced throughout your, that your career that you can offer folks advice on how to navigate? Uh, you're like, how much time do, do you, you guys, have? Yeah, like, do you guys have all day and all night? <laughs> um, so for most of my career, I've been one of the only women and women of color in the room. Um, so that's something that I've had to overcome, uh, talk about imposter syndrome. I, I still encounter it. And, uh, and then, it, you know, about five years ago, I also became a mother. So now I'm a woman, a woman of color and a mother in this industry. And a, you know, a lot that, that went into just like, how do I balance that all? How do I empower others like me to make sure that they know that this is fine and we should be here and there's no other question about that. So, you know, one of the things that you, we were talking about in the, in the back, you know, was saying like, how do you, you navigate this, this road, right? Mm -hmm. And you were saying, you know, women just, we need, to, we need to tell people what they want instead of asking. For what, talk a little bit more about that because I yeah. find that women in, the, you know, women in the workplace, queer people in the workplace, we often want to keep our heads down and just mm -hmm. do the job. And we're hoping that we will be recognized for that job. That's not really how things work right. nowadays. Yeah, so um, I, have a, I have a great little story. Um, I got into management by just literally asking for the job. I, I, I was on a team and um, I was already sort of playing a lead role and they were interviewing for a manager of the team. And at the time, I, I was thinking like, wait, I'm already doing this. Why can't I just do it for real? And so I went to you know, my VP and I, I told her, yes, her, that was one, the first time I ever got to report into a woman, which was incredible. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm already doing this role. Can I interview for this? She looked at me and she said, yes, why not? And so they put me through the standard interview process that every other candidate was going through. And I got the job, and I, I, I always look back at that experience because I was, you know, if I didn't ask for it at that moment, that position probably would have been filled by somebody else, and most likely at the time, somebody who was not a woman. Um, and so that experience has kind of taken me 
And I reflect back on that a lot when I'm asking for things for myself or for my team. Um, or it's not just about asking, it's about telling them, you know, this is what I need, this is what I want. And oftentimes, I, you know, I, I've found that that approach has been really powerful. Um, and so I, I continue to do that, and I, and I try to do that. Um, most recently, being a mother, uh, I just had my, my second child. Um, he turned nine months old yesterday. <laughs> um, and as part of, you know, being a mom in tech and being in a leadership role, like, I, I need flexibility. I'm, I can't work nine to five and then also go home and have a full-time job as a mom. So I, I told them, this is the flexibility I, I need. And as, as part of that flexibility, I'm giving them something back, right? I'm providing um, access to myself when they need me you know, whether that's sometimes off hours, whether that's early in the morning, but however, I'm trying to figure out what that balance is. And again, I told them, this is what I need, and they were respectful. And I totally appreciate that about BuzzFeed, and I think a lot of companies now are recognizing how powerful that could be to retain individuals, and especially retain women and mothers in tech. Wonderful. I wanna now um, open it up for questions in the audience. Again, if you raise your hand, there is a microphone that will go around. This is an Ask Me Anything. So, ask me, ask anything. me anything. Yeah. And by me, I mean Swati. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chloe Pai from Roe. Um, Hold it up a little bit so. Hello. Great. Can you better yes, now? thank Hi, you. I'm Chloe Pai from Roe. Hi, Chloe. Hi. Uh, so, there's been a huge push in the, well, the last like five couple of years for companies to build distributed teams, like strong distributed teams regardless of borders and cultural barriers, right? And from what I've heard, BuzzFeed actually puts a lot of investment towards that. I wanna learn a little bit more as to how you guys do at BuzzFeed and also build a culture that supports distributed teams. And on top of that, make sure that it's actually inclusive. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, one of the, what I feel like is one of the great things about um, our tech team is that we are a distributed team and each office is pretty much considered equal. Even though New York has the most amount of engineers and, and members in tech, we don't control the agenda. Um, so when, whenever there's a meeting or whenever there's a larger group setting, we are ensuring that all of our distributed offices across LA, Minneapolis, New York, and the UK, as well as our remote teams, our, our remote individuals, whether they're in the US or in Europe, are available for those conversations. Um, we leverage tools such as video chat, right, Slack. Um, we leverage collaboration tools such as Basecamp. And you know, we make sure that Google Docs as well, uh, we make sure that we are uh, uh, providing that availability to everyone, no matter where you're, you're located. Um, and we, we do have some, uh, some policies around like just quote unquote remote culture, some of the things that we expect. You know, we, we encourage people to be able to do remote conversations on video chat because you do get to see that person, you do have a connection with them. Um, another thing is we provide opportunities for travel. You know, there are individuals who prefer to, to work remote or in a distributed office, but face to face, and meeting your team in person is so powerful. And so we, we allocate budget, we allocate time throughout our, our, um, our year to make sure that these individuals are coming together. And I think that in itself is also something that you know, we invest in. Great. Another question, I saw another hand in the front. Do you see? Great. Hi. Um, Hi. Thanks for being here. Thank you. What's your yeah. name? Uh, everybody calls me Naps. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Um, when you're talking about being a mother and you know, like a policy or policy, like to help support, like what you need as far as time and how to distribute your time differently. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like structurally there's also support or culturally where like other people who work with you get that too? Like if, they, if that's not their lived experience, how do how do they then like? Um, I don't know exactly the question, but like, what is it like? Do they feel like you're getting special treatment or? Right, like, no, I, it's mm. a great question. Right. And um, 
everybody needs life work balance. It's, it doesn't matter if you're a parent or you know if you have a dog. Like it doesn't matter. It's all about life work balance. It's all about being able to uh, have that peace of mind that you can do what you need to do and also provide what you need to provide for the company that you or or the place that you work. Um, and so these things are. That's the messaging that needs to happen in these conversations, whether it's with HR or executive leadership. It's not just for one group of people, but it's for everyone. And how do we make that available for everybody? And so things around flexibility, distributed, remote working, it shouldn't just be for parents who have kids at home, mm -hmm. right? It should be made available to anybody who needs it. And so that's how we kind of look at it through that lens. Um, and ensuring that there is you know, fairness across. Great. Another question, this looks like the third row. Can you hold your hand all the way up? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Hey, thanks so much. Um, question, so. What's your name? Didi. Didi. Yes, Hi. nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So as the VP of engineering, you have to you know, work with multiple department, department heads and you know, give ideas. Do you, do you find that, you know, as a woman, when you're collaborating with different department heads at, but maybe not BuzzFeed, but other places that you've worked, um, where you've gotten, you know, pushback and kind of in a way where it is very obvious that you are a woman? Mm -hmm. And, you know, how did you um, handle that? Did you go to HR? Did you mm -hmm. kind of brush it off? Mm -hmm. um, did you tell your friends about it over drinks? <laughs> all of or the above. indeed, all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. Um, I'll never forget the one time I went to HR about a situation at a former employer, not where I'm at right now, but a former employer, and they told me that um, I should go talk to this other woman because she's experiencing the same thing. And I, I was shocked. This, of course, was before... Me too, and this huge, mo this huge movement that, yes, your word is good enough. This was back when your word wasn't good enough. You actually needed like mm -hmm. some physical proof. And even then, some people didn't believe you. But yeah, it, it, it's evolved a lot. Talking and speaking out loud is important. Telling your friends is important. Um, but at the same time, also, it's just, for me, it's, it's been reiterating, like, this is why I'm here. This is why I'm in this room with you all. Um, it, it's interesting, at, at BuzzFeed, my peers are majority women. Um, and um, that's been pretty powerful. Um, and in the past, I've learned, okay, how, how do I operate now when I'm the minority? Um, and so now I feel like I'm in this different position. Um, and I love it. <laughs> Woo! Woo! We have time for one more question. There, <laughs> I'm pointing to someone. She said, "Nah, okay." You were. Do we have a microphone? Oh, they they decided to go to the. They vetoed me. Wait, oh, I got one. That was not you. me vetoing you. I'm going to be doing a, a speaker. Them. Meet the speaker. Okay, at two in the back. So. If you're in the back, yes, thank you. Great. <laughs> Sorry, I got lucky here. Um, so, uh, my name is Sarah. I uh, hey, Sarah. am a graduate student in uh, studying fairness and transparency, accountability, and machine learning. So, I'm wondering um, what you kind of see behind the scenes on sort of algorithmic fairness. Um, is that an issue at BuzzFeed? Do you, like, mm -hmm. what, what sorts of things do you, um, do you find going on uh, that would be less than ideal? And then also, uh, from a design perspective, are there any things that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that design teams are actually taking a look at from that perspective? Yes. Um, so you were asking, I just want to make sure I understand your question, just some of the things around uh, how we're looking at, like, machine learning and fairness right. around that, and then also from a design perspective? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, we actually have forming and have started forming governance around data and how we use it, um, really putting together the ethics around our data. Um, and you know, with, with the uh, rise of GDPR and then also another law that's going to be coming up in California, CCPA, we, we need to be able to uh, 
uh, answer these questions to our users, not, you know, uh, even, even our, our, our peers and the platforms that we work with, such as Google or Facebook. Um, so documenting governance, having a governance process, um, and also uh, being upfront about, you know, how are we ethically using data and, and what are we gonna be doing uh, moving forward. Um, and this applies on the design side as well. All right. Swati, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, two things. We yes. are going to have a meet the speaker at 2 o'clock mm -hmm. on the rooftop. Another thing, um, I'm going to do a plug for our hiring. Uh, we are doing a lot of hiring on, across tech um, at BuzzFeed. Uh, we have a recruiter here, Julian Doucette, who's in the audience right now. Come meet Julian, us at the raise rooftop. your hand. Woo! Okay. Um, meet us at the rooftop at the at the Kimpton, and I'm really looking forward to speaking to more of you. Thank you so much. This is incredible. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So much. Thank you.